Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and uh, we're about to get started on discussions on the hospital budget guidance for 2022. Um, before we do that, we have a, a couple of things on the agenda, and I'm going to go to Susan first just because I believe that she has another engagement over at the Senate testifying there. So our executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a reminder for our advisory committee, we are accepting written public comments from them until April 1st. We've actually received a few so far. Thank you to those members who have already submitted your comments. We um, will post those. We're also sharing those with our partners at AHS and the Director of Healthcare Reform at AHS as um, they lead the way in terms of a subsequent agreement with the federal government on um, on all payer model. I also, Kevin, thank you uh, for saying Lori Perry and I will be um, popping off of this meeting at 1030. Um, Senate Health and Welfare has asked for a financial update on hospital, uh, Vermont hospitals. So um, thank you, Lori, for helping us out. Um, we know that uh, obviously Kevin and Patrick, who probably normally would do the update for them, will be otherwise occupied here at this board meeting. So um, when we finish up over there, we'll come back over to this meeting. So that is all I have. Um, I, I guess lastly, our April schedule should be out. We're, we're gonna try to get it out by the end of this week. It may be Monday. We're just tying up a few scheduling items. And that is all I have to report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Next, I'm going to go to the healthcare advocate who just wanted to clarify a few things from last week, um, Mike Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I wanted to come back to the HCA hospital budget questions. Um, we think the right thing to do at this point is to go ahead and submit our four questions to the hospitals. Um, uh, we do it. We, we want to do it now because we want to give hospitals plenty of time to consider them. Uh, that's part of the purpose. Um, with regard to the first part of question one, that the board I think has a placeholder about whether some version of that fits within the board's questions. We certainly would, uh, uh, if that process plays out in a timely way, and there's a better way of asking the question, we will we will adjust question one in line with that work groups. With regard to the second part of question one, I just want to call your attention to, I know hospitals said that they're not sure they can answer it. We, you know, the question says to the extent your organization tracks the information. Um, so um, uh, this is, uh, the HCA is, is doing our very best to be respectful of uh, how various hospitals manage things and the time in front of us. Um, uh, we've shown incredible restraint you should have seen our list of questions before we cut it down to four. Um, and so um, I, I, I want to repeat my offer to individual hospitals. If you have uh, questions or clarifications, or if the way we phrase the question makes it difficult for you to answer them, we're happy to talk. We had some uh, great conversations. I think it was with Northwest last year. Uh, between Northwest and and members of my team that I think was useful to both parties. And so we would we would welcome um, any any need for clarifications or any need uh, uh, for assistance in and them figuring out how to best answer our questions. We're, we're really after the spirit of the questions. Thank you, Mike. And um, j just as I said last week, the healthcare advocate absolutely has the statutory right to ask whatever questions they deem appropriate. And again, I want to thank the healthcare advocate and his team for, um, I believe, trying to follow the same um, basic premise that the Green Mountain Care Board has this year and trying to simplify the process and trying not to um, ask anything that doesn't need to be asked. And obviously, if you put 10 people in a room, you'll get 10 different ideas of what uh, needs to be asked and um, but again everybody's goal is to make this as easy as possible on the institutions that are dealing with the front lines of this pandemic so thank you mike thank you 
The next items on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 17th. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Tom Pelham and seconded by Maureen Yusufer to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 17th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the minutes were approved unanimously. So at this time, I'm going to turn um, the meeting over to Patrick Rooney and his team to um, lead us through um, uh, a brief um, recap of where we're at and start to take us through the decision points um, that will be necessary to be made today. And I'm going to ask all board members, unless it's a clarifying question on a particular slide, to please hold your questions to the end because I think that at this point, everything seems to be interwoven. And at the end of the slides, it might be the, the best approach to focus on um, a presumptive approval motion first and then move from there. Um, so with that, Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning, board, members of the public and stakeholders. <clears throat> We're here today on March 24th at the third of three scheduled meetings to discuss and consider the FY22 hospital budget guidance. So we had some incredible feedback last week and some very solid dialogue um, on the topics that we discussed at last week's um, guidance based on the slides that were presented and some of the recommendations. So we've taken in that feedback and kind of broadened the options and brought some more considerations before the board today. So that will be encompassed in what you see on the screen on slide two is a review of the, the third iteration of the guidance um, as we've come to know it over the last couple of weeks. And then hopefully we can get to some decision points today <clears throat> where we could get a uh, vote by the board and then the staff can go back and make any appropriate changes in uh, in context to the guidance process, the guidance um, as we know it, and then have that delivered before or by next Wednesday, March 31st per the statute. So should we get to that point today, a little over 100 days from now, we would be accepting um, hospital budget submissions on July 1st. So as the board chair discussed, we're going to move through this slide deck today in its entirety. It's, it's only about 15 slides, so that won't take long. Um, we have a um, <clears throat> process by which we work through this with MPR, change in charge, et cetera. That is by no means um, an explicit um, direction for the board. They can pick and choose topics as they wish. So should they choose to address the uh, exemption parameters and criteria first, certainly um, they have the ability to do so. So this is not um, the, the way we're going to roll through this slide deck does not mean that the board has to follow suit on, on those decision points. Um, so keeping with common themes here over the last couple of weeks, we're acknowledging the public comment that we've received in the interim uh, between these meetings that we've had in public here. And so since our last meeting on uh, March 17th, we received further public comment from Vaz and the uh, University of Vermont Health Network on March 18th and 19th, respectively, as highlighted on the screen here on slide three. And then we went and we made some changes based on Patrick, that. Patrick, uh, yes. uh, move on that. I just want to clarify that I believe there might be one item missing on uh, the, the public comment slide. And that is that uh, um, I want to make sure that we acknowledge receipt and the fact that board members have received and read the letter that came from Cap McGraw on behalf of all the chief medical officers around the state. Um, so just wanted to make sure that that was acknowledged as well even though it came in more recently. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You are correct. That did come in after we published the documents for today's meeting. Uh, so I will do some toggling back and forth after I read through the list here. These are some of the changes we made since last week. Our legal team went in and <clears throat> reworded some of the language around um, the board's establishment of MPR growth and it's uh, order to review and adjust hospital proposed operating expenses commensurate with any adjustments made to the hospital's MPRFP in order to protect margins. 
We also added a placeholder for exemption from public budget hearings in the guidance document. That discussion on exemption from public hearings really took hold last week throughout the, the time we were in our meeting. So we've added a placeholder for that and we can make appropriate changes as the board reaches decisions today. And then we added a question C under other operating and non-operating income based on the HCA's question around potential amounts received by hospitals related to COVID. So we included their question in our guidance document. And then it, that actually uh, triggered us to go back and look at our appendices. And I'll show you this as well, that in fiscal year 22 of the um, relief fundings appendices, we actually had a received portion for fiscal year 22, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you think about it, because they aren't going to book what they don't know um, they may or may not have. So we pulled that out and we really focused on 22 as what are you realizing from what you have received, 21 or 20, and then what is still sitting on your balance sheet? So we pulled that received part out of there, um, thanks to the HCA's question around potential amounts to be received. And then finally, and we just had an update to this from Mike Fisher, um, we did set a placeholder for the HCA's question. So we will go back and um, with a vote today and put their four questions into uh, part E of the appendices. <clears throat> So with that, I'm going to toggle over real quick to the actual uh, budget guidance. And I will just quickly note where we've made those changes. You can see here shaded in gray on page five of the budget guidance that we have the language that was reworked by our legal team around operating expenses. Then we have our placeholder for public exemptions and some of the criteria that you will see on the slide deck as we flew through it and the corresponding language from Act 91 to bring that um, exemption from public hearings into reality in this guidance document. Moving further down into the narrative section, we added Part C here for the HCA and we also corrected um, what I discussed earlier around the appendix for um, receipt of funds in 2022. We will not know what that is, um, and I will toggle over to that real quick. <clears throat> As you can see here on the screen, 20 and 21 have a column for amounts received. While well, the hospitals don't know that, we certainly don't want them putting um, imaginary numbers in there. So we will show what information or what dollars have passed through from here and is potentially going to be recognized in 22 or is continuing to be recorded as a liability. So those are the changes that we have made since our last meeting with some of the feedback that we received. <clears throat> and today, overall, for the board, um, these are some of the decision points that we want you to consider. Um, one is value-based care questions three through five on the guidance document. There was discussion last week about potentially removing those and including them in sustainability where they, more, they may be more of an appropriate fit. But we also wanted to acknowledge that um, some of that information may want to be kept in the budget guidance document as well. So we'd like the board to have a discussion and reach a conclusion on whether or not to keep or remove those items. And then we have to make decisions on uh, whether or not we set an MPR FPP growth guidance and charge guidance. And you'll notice we've removed the term ceiling from those items as opposed to last week. And there's a reason for that that we'll get to in a moment. And then we have setting public hearing exemption guidelines in which we would also need you to set NPR or charge parameters around that. And you will see the terminology using ceiling there as opposed to those broader bullet points above. Then we have the standing enforcement policy that we'd like you to consider for today. That does not mean you necessarily have to act on whether or not to waive it, but it's whether or not to adopt a standing policy or not. And then finally, with some of the feedback that we got from last week, we brought some suggestions forward from the staff for the board to consider about potentially reducing um, some work options in this guidance process from what we've presented thus far. And we'll get to those as we near the end of this slide deck. So moving through the NPR <laughs> growth component, we've added the option at 3.5% budget to budget NPR growth. And the rationale behind that is it's consistent with Vermont's economic growth and prior budget guidance in 2020 and 2021, two pandemic years. But we're taking a little bit of a different spin on it. And this is where we've removed the term growth ceiling is that 
We feel that it might be useful to have a point of reference for the board, hospitals, and GMCB staff analysis moving forward um, without it having to be a ceiling. So as I uh, alluded to, we've established 3.5 because it relates to Vermont's economic growth. And that considers the highs and the lows over time of how Vermont's economy grows. We are certainly in a state of flux right now, as I think we all understand as it relates to hospital finance. <clears throat> But establishing that 3.5% number, if we pull ourselves out of the man-made 12-month increments that we look at fiscal years in and we look back, it might be helpful to have that, that reference point uh, to say, wow, in 2020, we had negative 6.3% growth. So of that 3.5% potential, the system missed by 9.8%. And then what occurs in 21 and then what occurs in 22. And those three years are probably going to be the most significant years under this pandemic that we've lived in. So we think there's some value in keeping consistent with that, but having that 3.5% serve more as a reference point. So it's something the board is familiar with when looking at budgets, understanding that it, it may or may not be the right number, but as a reference point, how can we establish something so that we look back over our materials, we can say how everything shook out once we cleared this uh, pandemic. And then option two, we have the 3.5, the 3.0 percent budget to budget that we brought uh, last week, based on analysis of actual growth. Now, with both of these numbers, it should be understood that with the system coming in at negative 6.3 percent last year and this year yet to be determined, there is the potential that there could be, as we've all acknowledged, a little bit, a bit, little bit of room for um, more growth should our situation with the vaccine improve dramatically over the course of the summer. So that brings us to an option here that's not on the screen. That was floated last week, and we do think it's a fair point for the board to discuss as well, and that's no NPR figure. Now that would pose challenges to us looking back and assessing how the system fared against a certain um, demarcation point, but it certainly should be a discussion point for the board here today that potentially they, they, they don't want to act on and an actual figure. And then to round all of that out, the board does establish these guidelines, but it, it, it's not a hard and fast number. They do allow hospitals to exceed it. They do consider the budgets and specific needs of hospitals, but it's set, it's a number that's set there more as a reference point on an annual basis. And this year, it's a little bit more of a wild card as to what that could be, but it's still within the ability of the hospitals to exceed whatever number the board may pick. So those are the options that we've brought here today for discussion. We hope you will consider each one of them in reaching your final decision on whether or not to have an MPR FPP growth guidance for fiscal year 22. And then we have some language here around this to assist with any uh, motion that the board would like to make. We do hope that you will um, use this language verbatim and then fill in the blanks where possible so that we can cover our bases on appropriate motion language. And then slide eight, we're moving into the uh, charge request growth guidance discussion. Option one is to adhere to past practice and have no ceiling, with the exception of those exempted from hearing parameters. And the rationale is that we heard a lot of um, valuable feedback last week from hospitals and other stakeholders about opposition to having a ceiling in a year in which utilization could be all over the place and is widely unknown. Then we have option two, which is the 4% charge request that we brought last week from the staff analysis based on actual growth, plus a little bit of headroom there based on that historical growth. So we brought it up to 4%. Then we have option three at 3.5, which is more explicit when compared to the numbers you see below that, the five-year average and medians of um, 3.6 and 3.4 over 2017 to 2021, and five-year average and median of charge requests for 2016 to 2020, 2020 of 3.2 and 3%. So we've got a variety of options there, no ceiling, 4%, which is based on historical information with some headroom, and then a much more explicit 3.5% based on actual information from the past five years. <clears throat> and then we have some motion language here. If you choose option one, no ceiling for the system, with the exception of what parameters you set out in 
um, the exemption component of this. This language would only apply to two and three because you would be you'd be setting an explicit ceiling there for the hospital system as a whole. Should you choose option one, you need you can feel free to ignore this motion language. Moving on, the exemption from public hearing. We cleaned this slide up from last week. There was a lot of um, good dialogue around uh, and interest in this topic. So we do recognize that the board would need to use its Act 91 authority to open the exemption to public hearings to all hospitals. Um, so if folks remember that the, the existing rule now does say that the four largest hospitals need to come in for a budget hearing, this would basically waive that and open this potential up to all of the hospitals in Vermont's community hospital system. And then uh, important point here is that should the board choose to exempt a certain hospital that their budget will not be adjusted. So if the board chooses to exempt them, that is their budget for fiscal year. And then we cleaned up some of the criteria here around two important decision points that we need to hear from the board, NPR rate request and charge increase request ceilings of whatever you choose um, to be the, the maximum there. Uh, continued involvement in value-based care reform, the budgets, the budget assumptions should be deemed reasonable, the schedule should reconcile and the content should comply with guidance, and we would make a decision when we present preliminary budget presentations to the board on July 28th. So we would make a decision on that day um, as to which hospitals meet these parameters and do not have to come in for a budget hearing. We did, as a, as a note here, we did remove um, financial indicators from this. Um, board member Holmes brought up last week that if you use a median, for example, on days cash on hand, you automatically exclude a group of hospitals. None of those financial metrics are done in the vacuum. They are all interconnected. And so every time we tried to add one or subtract one, we ended up removing a large swath of our hospitals based on um, the variability we've seen in some of those numbers over the last couple of years. So we stripped that out completely. And we think the criteria here are the merits by which um, hospitals should look if they're going to produce a budget um, which would meet these parameters for the exemption from public hearing. So with that, we also have some motion language here to assist with your motion, and it recognizes the Act 91 authority, and it also recognizes um, this enhanced criteria for fiscal year 2022 that we've just discussed. <clears throat> Then we have our enforcement policy. So in the first iteration of these meetings uh, three weeks ago, um, our legal, te legal team brought um, to the presentation a standing enforcement policy um, that would sit over this process year in and year out unless there are substantive changes that need to be made that we cannot yet foresee. So you have two possible actions today. One, which I encourage you to do, is to adopt a, an enforcement policy. And you would want to state, as you can see here on the screen in the first part, whether or not that policy becomes effective in fiscal year 2021 or 2022. And then the second component of that is based on your decision, you have the potential to waive enforcement or not today. So you have two parts here, um, enacting an enforcement policy and then whether or not to actually enforce based on 2021 budgets. So <clears throat> there's two things you can do today, um, and certainly the, the latter part of that, you can choose to ignore if you want to. Finally here, um, based on the feedback we received last week, we went back and looked at some of the documents we've presented thus far and the content within it, and we found some areas that we'd like you to consider um, should you want to lighten the load on budget submissions for 2022. Um, a big part of that is when we originally put together all this work, as I discussed few, a few weeks ago, we did take a good long look at what last year's process brought through um, the presentations and deliberations in August and September and decisions in October. And we wanted to make sure that we fortified some of those points that we thought could add um, content to the discussions and deliberations this year based on what we learned from last year. However, if that's become a little bit more of a burden than we intended, then we want to recognize that. And so the parts that we would we want you to consider is um, refining the capital investment section in the narrative. And that would be stripping out a good portion of that 
detail and dialing it back to just a couple of questions around um, what are you still planning to do? Has it been put on hold? And then are there any items that are outside of your control that you have to do to maintain accreditation or something like something along those lines? So I'm not speaking in direct terms of what we would state, but that should give you an idea of what we were thinking about stripping out some of those items to ease that discussion on capital investment. And then in the appendices, we have four items here that were either added based on the lessons learned from last year, where we thought clarity could bring better decision making or items that we added back um, because there's been changes. So those would be the reconciliation or bridges tables and with the feedback last week and the unknown around budgets, perhaps additional detail in that area may cause more questions and more headaches than maybe it's worth this year because of all of the unknowns. So requesting detail and adding detail based on budgets that um, the folks at the hospitals may not even be comfortable with will, could probably um, bring about more questions and issues than we originally intended. Then we have the utilization table. We all know the challenges around that. <clears throat> and again, that was with the intent of building upon what we learned last year at some of the discussions. But if those, if the hospitals are uncomfortable with the workload and the accuracy of that, again, there's another item that could be more trouble than it's worth um, at this point here today where we're looking to make decisions. Then we added the inflation table this year. That was a discussion that permeated um, the budget hearings last year. So we wanted to see what we could do to better inform the board this year. Again, if that is more trouble than it's worth, we would um, consider that for removal as well. And then value-based care, we added that back in this year after a hiatus last year, but we've had some movement with Rutland Regional Medical Center adopting the Medicare program in value-based care, and then the Vermont State Employees Union signing on um, under the commercial portion of that. So we wanted to attempt to build that out a little bit this year. But again, we think these are the areas where in the appendices there could be consideration about removing them, which would leave us with the charge table that we reworked with the assistance of Boz this year. And whether we're in a pandemic or not, that is an important factor in the board's decisions. We would also have the um, financial breakout of revenues and expenses from the work that the hospitals are doing to vaccinate their staff and the community at large. And that is important because if we're going to hold them harmless from the revenues and expenses derived from that, those activities, then we want to make sure that um, we're appropriately accounting for those. And then finally, the relief funding table that I showed you earlier. So that's COVID related as well. And in an environment where COVID permeates every corner of this process, um, we think that um, that needs to be there as well. So that would leave us potentially with a minimum of three items in that financial work. And then finally, we would keep the adaptive submissions around income statement, balance sheet, payer mix, staffing, and capital as they are. So that's kind of the nuts of, of this product that we have here in budget guidance and hospital budget. So we would not want that to change at all for the sake of having an engaging conversation come August and September. So with that, we do have some potential motion language here for the board once they reach a decision to uh, adopt the guidance. And we would also uh, want to notify the public that should the board do this, there may be changes that need to occur and the staff can make those changes here in the next couple of days. We can circulate um, the guidance based on the vote today to the board to um, review and then have that out either before or on uh, March 31st of the coming uh, this coming week. So with that, Mr. Chair, I turn it back over to you and the board for discussion on these topics we presented this morning. Thank you so Thanks, much. Sir. And if we could get everybody to mute who's not speaking, that would be great. Um, again, um, I'm going to open it up to the board for questions first on everything that you've seen so far. Um, keep in mind that I am going to try to move in an order that I think might uh, create some efficiency. I may be totally off base, but the first uh, questions that I'm hoping that we can have a motion on when we get to that point is on the presumptive approval. So with that, I'm going to open it up to any board member that has questions for Patrick. 
I don't have a question for Patrick, but I do have a question for you. So, uh, Kevin, do you mean what Patrick's slides have titled exemption from public hearing criteria when you say a presumptive approval? Yes, I do, Robin. Okay, just wanted to make sure that there wasn't another concept out there I was missing. So thank you for that clarification. Uh, I just have a quick question for Patrick. Um, Patrick, in your uh, last recommendation about removing in the appendices the value-based care table as a possibility, um, I guess my question to you would be if the board uh, goes forward with the presumptive approval, one of the conditions that you recommended was continuation in value-based care uh, programs or, you know, value-based. So I'm wondering how would we know if they've met that condition or not? Is there another way um, that we would know that they've met that condition if we remove that table? You're muted, Patrick. Well, oh. After four weeks of presenting, that's the first time I've done that, so I feel all right about that. Um, yeah, I think we can ask them, um, just as we have any year, whether or not they're enrolled and what programs they're enrolled in. We did that last year without this table, so we can certainly do that again, and it wouldn't take much effort to do so. So are you suggesting include making sure that we included in the narrative there? Yes, so, and not absolutely. Anything yep. from the narrative. So the narrative questions would, be, would suffice for that meeting that condition? Yes. Great. Okay, thank you. Sure. And again, as I said uh, two weeks ago, I actually hope that the narrative um, question doesn't just focus on um, participation in an accountable care organization, but basically a move towards value overall, which could be talking about uh, communities working more closely together with all the different organizations so that um, they're reducing hospital um, readmissions by doing things differently and things like that. So hopefully when the staff does um, ask for that to be put in the narrative, we can have it a little bit broader than just um, ACO participation. Other questions from the board? Um, yeah, Patrick, I, I wanted to um, uh, talk about a topic that um, has, been, has been getting a little bit of press lately. And if, if you could um, maybe go, go to the part, the slide that shows where we talked about NPR and potentially adjusting operating expenses. And the reason I want to do that is I want to clarify, at least from my perspective, and I think it, it really goes with the board, what, what this was meant to do. And I want to um, just talk a little bit about it because there's been something circulating that basically says that the board is ignoring current reality, hindering recovery, threatening sustainability, and it said to call out one particular concerning development without process or input, the board is proposing to give itself the ability to regulate hospital expenses, putting itself in the role of deciding where our resources should be invested. We do not support a future in which the board can decide the clinical services of, of what we offer in response to the need of the communities. And I would say that's completely missing the purpose of what we're saying here and what we've done in the past. And so I want to give a very specific example. Um, we've done this the past couple of years. And in the case where we've done it, I'm not going to call out which hospital it was, but a hospital had requested an 8.7% increase in NPR and a 12.3% increase against their prior year projections. And the board, you know, specifically wrote in the orders, we are concerned about NPR FPP forecasts that are not supported by utilization and result in corresponding expense budgets to meet their NPR FPP forecasts. When hospitals fall short of NPR FPP targets and are unable to adjust expenses in a timely manner, lower and at times negative operating margins are, offered, are often the results. For these reasons, we approve a reduced NPR of 3.5 over the fiscal year budget, a 6% increase over the prior year projections, and expect the hospital to make appropriate reductions in operating expenses based on this more realistic increase in NPR FPP. So we have done this in the past for the reason really to help make hospitals more financially stronger and sustainable. 
And there were several hospitals who repeatedly came in with high numbers for NPR, missed those NPR numbers, but yet their expenses stayed right on where they budgeted them, and then they fell into negative operating margins. So after seeing this happen several years in a row for several hospitals, including one that went into bankruptcy that we specifically said the same things to over the top, over the over several years that's really what that was for so i just want to make sure that's out there at least on record from my perspective um i can't speak for the rest of the board about why we have that in there um it was not intent to limit um what hospitals are doing to to actually you know go line by line on expenses to cut clinical operations or anything it was really to help preserve the hospital's financials because again repeatedly we've seen where it's very difficult for a hospital to be able to make adjustments to their expenses that they budgeted and they miss the top line and um if anyone wants to talk to me about it offline happy to do it there's several examples of where we've done that and i, I just wanted to make sure that's at least out in the record <laughs> so if there's any more reporting about it you know, it's, that's not the intent that we were getting into the weeds of expenses and managing expenses. The intent was really to make sure we have strong hospitals that are financially sustainable. And in cases where we've shown there's been the aspirational budgeting, I know people probably hate that word, but it's repeatedly some, same hospitals that have done that year over year, we started to say, look, you know, we're reducing you to three and a half, or in this case, it was 7% against the prior year. And we actually told that hospital, if you're actually exceeding that, come back and talk to us. We're not telling you to cut clinical services. We're just trying to make it more realistic and to budget appropriately expenses so that you can make it. So just wanted to get that out there. And uh, if anyone wants to give feedback, that's fine. But um, I just, just didn't want to leave it unsaid because there's been a lot of write-ups lately that I, I think have been um, putting a different narrative out there. So thanks. This is Robin. Um, Maureen, I totally agree. I think that was a great clarification because I, I do not think that there have been instances where the board has been getting into line item micromanagement. I think we've been very careful not to do that. So thank you for um, clarifying that. Um, I would also just say it's my understanding from staff that this was also something that uh, the Banking, Insurance, Securities, and Healthcare Administration did when they were managing hospital budgets. So it's not like this is out of the blue new uh, process, but actually was something that's been in place for quite a long time. Um, but related to this, I had a suggestion in the new operating expense language that might add further clarification that I wanted to propose for people's consideration, which is, so Patrick, maybe you could bring up the guidance part so people could see that when I um, make my suggestion. I think it's page five of the guidance document. There it is. So what I would suggest is um, that where, so it says currently in connection with establishing a hospital's NPR FPP growth limit, the, more, the board may review and adjust the hospital's proposed operating expenses. And this is where I would make the change. I would say the, the hospital's proposed operating expense growth in the aggregate uh, and then commensurate with would from there on would remain the same. So it would basically just be a little clearer that we're looking at the upper, like we're looking at the aggregate growth here. We're not getting into line items um, or micromanagement of actual expenses. So um, that would be my, just a small suggestion to maybe add further clarification along the lines of what uh, we've done in the past and what you were saying, Maureen. Is that a motion, Robin? Yeah, I'll go ahead and move that we modify uh, the budget guidance on page five to read um, in connection with establishing a hospital's NPR FPP growth limit, the board may review and adjust the hospital's proposed operating expense growth in the aggregate commensurate with any adjustments made to the hospital's NPR FPP in order to protect margins. Is there a second? Second. 
Is there further discussion? I just want to uh, thank Maureen for at the last meeting and at this one for um, you know, um, explaining what has happened in the past and that it hasn't been uh, an instance where the Green, Green Mountain Care Board kind of uh, engaged in the weeds of line items on an operating budget, but is trying to overall match the revenues and operating expenses so that uh, uh, you know they're reasonably related. And so uh, thank you for that, Maureen, and thank you for the motion, Robin. Other discussion from the board? And what I'm going to do on any motion before it's voted on is open it up to the public for any comment. So not hearing any further discussion from the board, I'll open it up for me, to any member of the public who wishes to comment on this motion. Hearing none, I'm going to ask uh, General Counsel Barber to call the roll. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Member Useford? Yes. Uh, Member Holmes? Yes. Mr. Chair? No. So let the record show it was a four to one vote. And um, with that, if we could go back to um, further questions of Patrick from members of the board. Yeah, I, I have one question. This has always been a bit confusing to me. Um, uh, going to slide eight, I think it was. Having to do with charges, yes. Um, I'm just wondering, Patrick, if you could dig a little bit uh, deeper there in terms of uh, profiling how the changes in charge at these uh, proposed rates or with, with, with no um, uh, a ceiling at all, how they relate to to say an NPR uh, figure that that um, we might pick three percent, three and a half percent, whatever it is. You haven't gotten there yet, but how how does it, the change in charge and the NPR um, align themselves? You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, it's a little more complex than that. Charge is just one component of what dri ultimately drives NPR. Utilization is the other. So with utilization being as unknown, as inconsistent as we've seen over the presentations the last few weeks, whether it's fiscal year 20 or what we've heard from hospitals so far, I cannot tell you conclusively that there is a perfect number for this because of that. There's no uh, reasonability to utilization right now. We have hospitals who are telling us that they're seeing a rebound, and we have hospitals who are saying the exact opposite of that. So as this only relates to one major component of what ultimately drives NPR, there's no perfect answer to that in relation to NPR from my perspective. Well, I, I mean, I get I get the relationship of the rate and the utilization rate times volume. I get that. So um, but that all happens totally off our screen. I think that's a um, a, a calculation uh, that gets made at the hospital level and maybe um, in in conjunction with, with with the payer. And I'm just wondering your thoughts about, you know, whether or not this is an area where, um, you know, when we, we look back on it, the, the, that calculation that happens um, outside our purview is one that um, ends up with an NPR uh, revenue number that is much higher than expected or lower than expected. I cannot comment on that. I'm sorry. I do not have an answer for you. Thanks. Um, maybe to try to like move forward some of the things we're talking about, maybe looking at the NPR guidance that you had, the different suggestions. Um, and, you know, I think 
when we talk about, you know, I, I would just throw out in discussion, when, when we talk about an option like potentially number one, which is a 3.5 budget to budget, um, and then, you know, I could see potential where if a hospital um, may exceed that, if it was supported by utilization shifting from prior years, because we know, you know, really we had actually put that, you know, kind of concept in the guidance last year, expecting that um, this current year we may get, you know, utilization shifting in and probably really hasn't happened yet because we didn't expect we'd still be going forward with the pandemic as long as it has. And so, you know, that may shift from um, 21 until 22 where, you know, Finally, people may feel comfortable going back to the hospitals or going back for appointments, and it, it may exceed. So, you know, I'm okay, um, you know, under the current conditions with the pandemic that, you know, not putting a ceiling and maybe, um, you know, maybe even talking about if supported by utilization shifting from the prior years. And, you know, and I do like the last bullet which, you know, as it has been in the past, and, and if you read through, you know, all of the prior orders that we put through, you know, they really are very targeted to the specific hospitals that we're dealing with in their conditions. So I, I think that, you know, when we talk about the establishing these guidelines, we do consider budgets and specific needs of each hospital. And, and maybe, um, you know, we could be more explicit about that. Um, as we talk about the guidance. So thank you, Marina. Thank you for filling that void of silence. I was on mute and uh, didn't realize it as I was uh, speaking when uh, Patrick stopped. Um, but I do think I'm going to try to stick to that uh, original framework that I laid out um, to try to um, be as productive and efficient as possible today. And I'm going to ask everybody to focus their discussion on um, the waiver of hearing, or as I have referred to it, the presumptive approval. And if Patrick, if you could go to the language on the motion, that might be able to help board members focus on the discussion as um, we move there, because I don't think that anybody is talking about uh, a waiver of a ceiling or anything on um, presumptive approval. I could be wrong, um, but if we could um, begin the discussion on um, the exemption from public hearing and uh, focus there. I think that uh, we'll be able to move through very uh, efficiently. So board members. Sure, I'm happy to jump in here, um, Kevin. Um, so I think that where I sit as I, I'm very comfortable with the criteria that's been laid out, having it be an exemption for all hospitals using our Act 91 authority. Um, involvement in value-based reform, the basic assumptions being reasonable, submission schedules reconcile, um, you know, co budget content complies with guidance and having the deadline be July 28th. So I'm comfortable with all of that. And I would throw out there as a, a, a ceiling two parameters, uh, NPR FPP rate request at or under 3.5%. Um, and the charge increase request at or under 3.5%. And I'll tell you where my um, kind of uh, my justification. So the 3.5, this has been the median budgeted growth for the past five years. Actual, median actual has been lower. It's been closer to three. Uh, but I think that there is a real possibility of pent up demand. So 3.5 is aligned with what we've previously budgeted, but it also allows for the fact that there's probably some pent up demand in there and actual has come in at three. So we're, we're allowing for that possibility. Uh, in terms of the change in charge at 3.5, uh, that was the median for 2021, which had some higher than normal adjustments that year to address prior year losses. Um, I think also if you look at the CMS National Health Expenditure Report that was actually submitted to us by VAS, um, in there, they are projecting uh, price growth for medical goods and services to be 2.4% for 2022. That's their healthcare price index. Um, so I think that's a median starting point, at least if we're thinking about that's what CMS is projecting for median price growth. And I, you know, we have to recognize that 2.4% uh, 
2.4, you know, is just the inflationary component that often the change in charge has to acknowledge that um, the realities of creating a margin and also, you know, is probably going to have to absorb some of the uh, cost shift that we know exists in the system. So for me, 3.5 gives them that cushion above what the projected medical inflation is. So that's where I would feel comfortable for a presumptive approval. Thank you, Jess. Other board members' thoughts on the exemption from public hearing? Um, yeah, I'm supportive of of the ranges that, uh, or the numbers that Jess came forward with. I agree with the 3.5. Um, it, it gives a, a 3.5 NPR. It gives room for you know any of that utilization, and and the 3.5 on the commercial or, or in the rate. Um, maybe a little bit higher than where some places people were last year, but I think with trying to streamline the process and allow some hospitals to be able to move forward without having a hearing, I think if we went much below that, we may find not many would, would qualify. And, and obviously the hope is that, and, and belief is that the hospitals are only going to ask for what they need in that area and we have seen in the past hospitals have asked for under under three we heard cfos talk last week you know they have different parameters for for what drives their decision on commercial rates so so i i would support um support that as well um and then just somewhere in at least that filing, if, if a hospital comes in and, and you know, meets the, the criteria to not have a public hearing, um, allowing them the option to either come in and just talk to us at that time, or maybe they'll feel more comfortable after budgets are fully approved, you know, like and gone through, but, you know, coming in because I think it gives them an opportunity to you know, just, just tell us their story, what's going on, what the risk and opportunities are. Um, and so, you know, again, either doing it, you know, we wouldn't, we would, it wouldn't prevent them from coming in to talk to us. I know that sounds crazy that they'd want to do that, but we have heard some, some of the hospitals and, you know, and, and even through, um, you know, people at BOSS that they do, you know, appreciate at least being able to tell their story. So if they've met that criteria that's going to be approved and they want to come in, maybe it's either a skinny down meeting or, or post, um, you know, post approvals, maybe it's a little bit after, but uh, we just like to at least have a check the box for them if they want to come in and they may all say no, but let's, you know, give them that option. Okay, other board members? So I, guess I, I just want to understand, are you recommending those uh, uh, in, NPR increase rates in this motion, or is this, uh, we still looking at this motion in its kind of generic form? So uh, as I understand, she didn't uh, make a specific motion yet, but it looks like she's indicated that she would like to make a motion just for the purposes of the exemption from public hearing um, that would um, keep the July 28th deadline as outlined by staff and set the NPR and the charge request at the same rate of 3.5%. But I haven't heard a motion yet, Tom. And this is only for the purposes of the exemption from public hearing. Yeah, just to build on that, um, Kevin, yeah. Tom, I'm only, these are, the, these are the parameters for exemption from public hearing. So um, as you may recall from the last meeting, I am not um, going to support uh, NPR ceilings or the new word is uh, guidance um, or change in charge overall. So I'm, I'm really just setting the parameters that I'm comfortable with for the public hearing exemption. Great. Thank you. Other board members? Um, Robin, I, I think I heard you start to talk. Yes, um, so I am supportive of ex doing an exemption from public hearing. Um, I appreciated the public comments that came in that were more explicit and actionable, uh, sort of oriented to action um, that we received, so I did want to make that note. Um, I like Maureen's idea also of allowing flexibility so that if folks after you know, whenever want to come in to discuss that that's good, but I, 
also think that having the clear process be clear is important. Um, I am supportive of the 3.5% NPR guidance. I'm probably a little bit higher on the charge. Like I would, I would err more towards four. And I do realize that this is the exemption, not the overall. Um, so I'm going to continue to think about that as we discuss. So like uh, um, the motion that came from Jess, I would be comfortable with an exemption for um, hospitals from the uh, public hearing at the 3.5 rate. Anything higher than that, um, I really believe that they should have to come in at um, and make their case before the board. And, you know, again, that's just one board member. Other board members? Yeah, I'd like to add to that, Kevin. I, um, I'm, I'm fine uh, with the exemption um, from the hearing process um, at 3.5. Um, I do want to take a minute here and just paint in some context about anything, at least from my perspective, about anything higher than that elsewhere. Um, so it'll take me maybe a minute just to uh, give this profile. But if you go back to the, the emergency board on August 12th of uh, 2020, um, they reported to the, uh, the DIVA reported to the emergency board that uh, they're, they were $34 million below their fiscal 20 budgeted amount for Medicaid. Um, later on August 19th, the DIVA, as, as we know, and, and we put it in all of our, our um, budget orders, that they'd be level funding Medicaid reimbursement rates in 2021. Um, <clears throat> except for those that are federally mandated. Um, the, uh, but so that's kind of what's going on, um, you know, in terms of, of, of Medicaid. You know, and the Department of Labor um, release just came out on March 15th, and it shows that there's still 30,000 unemployed Vermonters relative to a year ago, January 20th. Um, and the State general funds, as of a uh, report uh, on the 23rd, uh, are up $31.4 million above target for February and $46.53 million, you know, um, over the target to the year to date. And then we have this, obviously, this notice of information that Vermont, is, as according to Senator Leahy, is, is likely to get $2.7 billion dollars. Um, in additional uh, uh, COVID relief money. So I know that the Green Mountain Care Board, we don't have the money. We either, um, but, but we are kind of a broker for it. And I think some people just assume that the um, uh, rate payers, premium payers, co-payers, people with deductibles are kind of the default for anything that, that the, the, the public sector isn't, uh, isn't contributing its fair share. And I just want to emphasize to some of those that are uh, frustrated with us for trying to be a regulator that there are other players here that they can influence. Um, and, and in an extraordinary environment where state revenues are coming in over the gunnels, um, federal money is coming in uh, over the gunnels. And uh, um, so I, I'm just, I would be resistant uh, I think 3.5% is a fair share. It's the all-payer model. It's, it's the number that we've been trending with, and we should stick to that in terms of what, what we look to the insurers to help fund. But anything above that, um, uh, we shouldn't go. And in my opinion, we shouldn't go there. Thank you, Tom. I was a little bit worried there for a minute that you were going to try to set the uh, reimbursements for Medicare and Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs> if I would, I could. <laughs> well, if I could, I would. <laughs> Other board discussion. Um, maybe it would be helpful, um, Jess, if you actually put your thinking into a motion and try to get a second, and then we'll continue the discussion. Sure. Okay. So I'm using the language that's that's here. Uh, so for the 2022 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board, pursuant to its emergency authority under Act 91, establishes an exemption for the from the requirement for public budget hearings for hospitals that meet that criteria identified the bo by the board, which would be an NPR FPP rate request at or under growth guidance of 3.5 percent, charge increase request at or under 3.5 percent 
continued involvement in value-based value care reform, budget assumptions are deemed reasonable, budget submission schedules reconcile, budget content complies with guidance, and meeting the exemption decision deadline uh, we would have imposed by July 28th. Is there a second? I'll second it. Just as a friendly uh, question, I know that um, Maureen asked this, Jess, would you uh, oh. Yes. Possibly consider adding language that just gave hospitals the choice, even if they were um, presumptively approved to come in and uh, tell their story. Absolutely. I agree with, with Maureen's comment. I enjoy hearing from the hospital. So absolutely, this does not preclude uh, hospitals from coming in and sharing an update on uh, what's happening in their communities and in their hospital. Okay. And Maureen is the seconder. You're fine with that, aren't you? Yes, second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So with that discussion from the board. I guess I'll just say I can count to three. So uh, I'll <laughs> go with the 3.5% because I'm supportive of everything else in the motion uh, with the exception of the charge increase. So, but I'm obviously in the minority. I thought you were going to say you could count to 3.5. <laughs> I can do that too. I can even count to five. <laughs> Other board discussion before I open it up to public comment? Hearing none, I'll, I'll invite any member of the public to add any comment at this time on the motion that's in front of us. And I do see Mike Del Treco has his hand raised. Mike? Yeah, th thanks, uh, Chair Mullen, um, and thanks for the dialogue and conversation. I, I ha It's really hard to separate all of the discussions around rate and charge uh, just to um, uh, exemption from the public hearing. So I apologize if I sort of tie some things together, specifically to slide six and eight and the recent discussion around um, your, your motion that's on the table. Um, to speak to uh, Jessica Holmes' conversation around the 2.4% from um, Medicare, that's certainly the personal health care spending amount, which is, is which which is proposed to drive where hot where patients and and folks in the public start to come back to hospitals. It doesn't reflect the hospital's actual inflation for buying medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, and such. And this is where I tie back to slides six and eight. I I have a really difficult time um, listening to uh, the board deliberate on um, why three and a half or four is the right number, and it's steeped in history. When we keep looking at history, we ignore the financial results that we have seen. We, we, know, we know that our hospitals are um, in financial distress, not not only because of the pandemic, but that's partly the reason. Um, I think we need to consider, and and I'd love to hear what the board has to say around how do we balance and look at not only healthcare inflation, what it costs our organizations to pay for workforce, pay for medical supplies, pay for new pharmaceuticals that aren't in their book of business, pay for the inflation on uh, existing pharmaceuticals. And the alignment there um, is well above three and a half or three percent growth rates. So, so I just, I just can't can't ignore that fact of of looking forward is more important than looking backward. Um, so, uh, on on how we've historically performed. So, I'm sorry I commingled a bunch of things together on this specific uh, vote, but it was hard to break apart. So, thank you for the opportunity to speak. That's completely OK, Mike, and I guess you're going to have to lower your own hand because usually I can lower people's hands. Oh, I can do but, that. But somebody just did it, so okay. uh, somebody had the ability. Um, Mike, uh, just to say that uh, um, I think that the board will be looking forward and trying to make sure that Vermont has a sustainable health care system. But I think the whole um, purpose of trying to uh, align um, the growth in hospital spending with the growth in the economy is that we saw uh, a tremendous run up between 1990 and uh, 2010 in the growth of uh, 
healthcare spending as a percentage of the state's economy. And that requires everybody to try to figure out new ways to do things and new ways to create efficiencies. Because in the long term, if that had kept on that growth trajectory, um, it would be unsustainable. Vermonters would not be able to afford to pay for their care. And a number of Vermonters would have to no longer buy insurance. So not to try to get into a debate with you, but just to, to point out that um, the board recognizes the fragility of the system. The board recognized it a few years ago and uh, um, was very vocal about it at that time. Um, we recognize that the fragility continues, but we also recognize that we have to all together keep the conversation going, which has been muted um, throughout the past year because of the pandemic, but how we might be able to do things differently so that Vermont can afford their health care system and have the best health care system in the country. So, um, Could you, Would you mind if I made one comment to that? Go right ahead, Mike. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, couldn't agree more. And and you've heard me say before, we, we've taken, taken our system from a growth rate of over eight percentage points year over year from a net revenue point of view down to ones that are below or, or hover around 3%. Not only has um, our revenue come down, but our operating expenses have followed suit. And, and I think Patrick has pointed out on more than one occasion, we've become so heavily dependent on uh, the other operating revenue in our systems that we that we I think we tend to forget that um, and and maybe I'm speaking of myself there sometimes and, and I, I don't want to put that on you but I but I think we have done all of the things you described and I think it's all in the spirit of of affordability and caring for our communities I just think we're at a really uh, interesting inflection point that I don't think we can keep doing what we're doing. And I think the sustainable sustainability conversation is um, one that's uh, complex and, and will take many, much time. And I suspect that in that time, we'll have many hospitals continue to have uh, margins that are uh, negative. And, and I just think, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from uh, a little bit of passion here that we, we are at a, at a really interesting point in time where I think we need some growth opportunity uh, and and uh, at three, three and a half percent, it doesn't do it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And again, this is just so that someone could be presumptively approved and have their hearing waived. This is not precluding anybody from a higher amount if they make a compelling case at hearing. Thank you. Okay. Other members of the public? Hearing none, um, the motion before us is to um, create an exemption from hearing for all hospitals using our um, authority under Act 91 and um, utilizing a deadline of July 28th and utilizing um, the following numbers for NPR slash fixed perspective payment 3.5% and for charge growth, 3.5%. Um, keeping the ability to still have a presentation and just what language have I left out? <laughs> Sorry, just all the, there's, there's that criteria that had to be met. There was that list of criteria. Um, let me find that slide now. Um, continued involvement in value-based care reform, not limited to ACO participation. Budget assumptions are deemed reasonable. Budget submission schedules reconcile. Budget content complies with guidance. Okay, is there any further discussion from the board? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Signify by saying nay. Hearing none, let the record show that the motion was approved unanimously. So um, with that, um, if we could um, start to proceed um, 
working through some of the other questions that are before us today. Um, I would like to um, go first towards the question on um, value based care questions, and I believe it was three to five. Patrick, if you could go to that particular slide. So um, I believe it may have been um, Member Holmes again at the last meeting that suggested um, removing questions three through five. And uh, so we'll we'll start uh, and see if there's any um, consensus to um, remove anything or to keep it as is. So um, board member discussion. This is real. Let me. Oh, I'll end Robin first. Okay. Um, so I think uh, questions three through five raise very interesting and important parameters. However, I don't think we need to discuss it as part of this process. Um, it 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 is information which is really quite central in terms of the future of. Uh, the ACO model and healthcare reform. So it is a conversation that I think is very important and necessary to have. But again, I can support taking it out of the hospital budget guidance because I think that that conversation could happen as part of sustainability or as part of the public process around the all pair model um, and, and the future of that agreement. Um, so in the, in the spirit of trying to streamline this process, um, I can support taking it out. Uh, along that lines, I guess my question is, um, do we need both the narrative and the uh, spreadsheet? Like, is there a way to either choose one or the other? I think I probably can be satisfied with one or the other. Um, and so I just wanted to throw that concept out there for other people to react to. Before I throw it out to other board members, um, Patrick, what was your intent? We had no intent here. We um, added questions to help tie together the value-based impact and hospital budgets. And then it was proposed that um, we could potentially do without and transfer these, this information to the sustainability planning process. So it's simply up for discussion and consideration by the board. The staff have um, no perspective on this whatsoever. I think about my question, I probably should have framed it a little bit better, but I think that board member Lunge was asking the question if it would still be part of the narrative. No, my question was broader. My question was, so right now we're asking for information in the narrative that is redundant of the spreadsheet. And so could we either get it in the narrative or in the spreadsheet and not in both places? So, so that was my question. My answer to that would be yes. I think that depends on whether the board feels the narrative adds more context um, than just numbers on paper, or if they're more comfortable with um, the table in the appendices instead of having the background from narrative. So that I think is a preference decision on behalf of the board. Okay, board members. Yes, I'd like to uh, chip in here a little bit. Um, I uh, worked on this language with Elena, and the reason I kind of pursued it is that it uh, it's it's very clear that FPP is foundational to healthcare reform in Vermont. It's foundational. It's not a, a tangential uh, concern. It, it's foundational. And um, if you look at the 2021 budget over 2020. Um, the amount of FPP is flatlined at around 14%. And this is FPP that, um, as Elena will say, is, is not good FPP because it includes all the Medicaid with the true ups, et cetera. So it's, um, you know, so, I, so from my perspective, we're sitting here four years into the all pair model, our um, blueprint for reform. We don't have any guiding star at all um, in terms of what the FPP level is that we need to achieve the kinds of capitation, mild capitation that will achieve the efficiencies 
that we're looking for and that we could be using now. And we're already kind of talking about um, all pair model uh, number two. Um, we, you know, we, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, we, I, I, just, I just think that we're flying blind here. And so from my perspective, I thought hearing from the hospitals um, as to what they think about where they should be. Um, I have no idea hospital by hospital um, where they think they should be to achieve the kinds of efficiencies in healthcare reform that, that the all payer model offers. We can look at uh, Southwestern. Um, they're at 22% FPP, um, and they clearly, according to that bigger article, have used uh, the freedom um, that, that fixed prospective payments allow to dramatically restructure how they relate to the community in terms of, of uh, transitional services. So, um, you know, this is this is something that I that that I think we should have had re resolved a long time back. And it's also a budget issue in the budget. Um, this will get addressed every single year in a disciplined kind of way to kind of push the ball down the court to um, uh, to uh, achieve the, the goals of the all payer model. And I I, you know, it, one could make an argument that it belongs in the sustainability project, but sustainability is a one is 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 a one time kind of effort, uh, maybe over a couple of years. But I, I I think that we have to give more definition to FPP. We have to understand what folks in the field feel about it, where they expect it to go. Um, um, you, uh, we've all seen the, the images of the two two canoes. You know, and I sometimes feel that um, you're looking at at uh, the, the, the 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 flatlining of FPP 21 over 20. Even UVM Medical Center, which owns 50 percent of, of of the ACO, they had a slight decrease in their FPP 22 over 21. So I, I think that we've got to put a spotlight on this, and uh, this is a way we thought, or I thought of, with Elena's help, to put a spotlight on it so that we can um, push this element of reform um, uh, you know, to the forefront and, uh, um, and help advise us in terms of, of even relating to in rate review. You know, what do we have to say to the insurers in order to get them to participate with hospitals in transitioning to FDP? So I, I think this is, I think we're already a day late and a dollar short and uh, after four years and um, I, I would I would support keeping it. I do support keeping it in in, in, in the budget budget guidelines. Thank you, Tom. And I just want to say that I too share some of the concerns that you've raised. And I think that um, I, I want to be consistent with where the all payer model improvement plan made suggestions for ties into the budget process. Um, not that we obligated to anything like that. And I do think that um, as part of our obligations under the current model to, cr to create a report to the federal government by December, that we're going to have to have the stakeholder engagement with the hospitals. Now, we probably can get that through a different means than um, the budget process, but I'm not sure what time we really save the hospitals um, by taking it out of the um, the uh, budget process, because I think that, um, you know, this discussion is going to have to occur. Tom? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with that, Kevin. I think that, uh, uh, and, and again, that this isn't a, a, a highly restrictive request of hospitals. It's just asking them to explain to us, you know, you know, you know how, how they see this unfolding. It, it's aspirational. I mean, if they all come back to us and say, hey, look, we're fine at 14 percent, you know, we don't want to go any farther then maybe we should roll up our tents and go home, you know. But if they say, gee, we, we should get to 30, 35, 40 percent before it really starts to kick in. Well, that's good to know that uh, so that we're not uh, feeling that we're pushing something down their throats that they really don't want. So uh, here we are four years out and nobody can tell me you know, um, uh, whether or not 14% is going to make it or break it in terms of uh, health care reform in Vermont. And, and FPP is a foundational uh, aspect of that. 
I just want to say I don't disagree with anything either of you said, but if we're waiving hearings for hospitals who meet the targets, it's not going to be a consistent process across hospitals. So we're going to have to do a second process anyway. So in my mind, like if this were a normal year, I'd be like, absolutely, let's hear about it. We do need the information. We need it, quite frankly, sooner than later to meet the December got a uh, December deadline. Um, so I agree with absolutely all of that. I just think that it will end up being a redundant process because we're going to have to do it. And I agree getting it. I want to know from each individual hospital their views and how it's working because I think that will make for a better proposal next year. And I think hospitals want to be involved, um, you know, assuming there is another APM proposal. I think hospitals would want to be leaders there. So, um, you know, I certainly don't disagree with any of the intent or the conversation or the desire to get the information. I 100% with you. I just think it will end up being duplicative because there will be some hospitals, presumably, that will have their hearings waived and be presumptively approved and will need to circle back and talk with at least those. I think just to clarify, though, if we're waiving, we're waiving the hearings, but they still would have to provide all of the information. I'm actually OK if we remove and include it in sustainability. But just to clarify, I think the expectation right is the hearings are waived, but the materials are submitted so that we have all True, the materials. So I would suspect we will have questions because in order to thoroughly answer a question, how has the hospital changed the way the hospital delivers care? That's not like a three sentence answer, right? Like that's to me, that's a much longer discussion. And so part of the challenge will be, you know, this, I think the questions if we're either going to get bad, not bad, but we're going to get minimal answers that aren't that helpful or there, it needs to really be a dialogue. That's just my no, just, I just wanted to clarify to make sure, you know, from the hospital and from everyone's perspective, everyone, they do have to answer the questions and submit, you know, full submission. Uh, but you're right, yeah. certain things may Great need clarification. And I'm okay with moving in sustainability. I just wanted to, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty flexible on on this one, but uh, let's see, we'll see where everyone else wants. Thanks. Other board members? I'll just say I can go either way. I think that um, to me, it's very important to, to everybody's point that we hear from the hospitals about these issues to the degree that fixed payment is the foundation of how we're going to achieve um, delivery system reform. We need to understand that. We need to understand that for any negotiations we're making with the federal government. We need to understand that with respect to the ACO, with respect to sustainability planning, all of that, um, you know, information is going to be important for all of those efforts. To me, this is just a question of does it appear here or does it appear in another uh, process that the board is undertaking? And so to me, to some degree, this may give some flexibility to the timing of when this material, you know, has to be submitted. Um, I think the, the sustainability planning will be a little bit delayed, you know, past the hospital budget submission. It'll probably be later in the summer that that work is, is happening. So this might give some relief up front uh, as the hospitals are trying to prepare their budgets for some of these deeper questions about uh, how we move forward towards value-based payments. So, so, but I could go either way. I proposed it as a way of some, some uh, short-term relief, but certainly we need the information uh, before December. And in fact, before we submit even our hospital sustainability report to the legislature in September. Would anyone wish to make a motion? If there is no mo if there is no motion, does it, is, does it stay in? <laughs> Well, that would depend on the final motion over the adoption of the total guidance. I, I don't think it makes any sense to put this decision off. I think we should yeah. come to an answer one way or the other. So hopefully somebody will make a motion. I can make a motion if you want, Tom, or you can. No, no, no. I, would not. <laughs> I, I, know, I know what your motion would be, I think. So um, uh, I, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll make a poorly worded motion. Um, I, I move that we retain the um, uh, value-based care questions uh, three through five in the 2022 budget guidelines. Is there a second? Uh, 
I'll, I'll second it because Tom likes to have it seconded <laughs> that we can have a discussion if we need. Thank you, Maureen. It's been moved and seconded to retain questions three through five on value value based care. Um, is there further board discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the motion that's before us regarding value based care questions. Members of the public. Hearing none, the motion before us is to retain questions um, three through five on the, the value based care. And I'll ask um, General Counsel Barber to call the roll. Member Yusufer. Ooh, put me on the spot right at the beginning. <laughs> um, I said I could go either way on this one, so I'll say yes. Member Lunge. No. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Holmes? <laughs> wow, usually I'm so decisive. Uh, I'll say no. And Mr. Chair? Yes. So let the record show that uh, by a three to two vote, um, Questions three through five concerning value-based care will remain in the guidance. So um, the next question, I think, if we can try to uh, um, keep things efficient and moving, a, a good question might be to decide whether or not we will adopt a standard enforcement policy. Realizing that many people um, may opt to not want to um, have any enforcement um, and that's certainly where I am for the current year, but I do believe that uh, we should have a standing enforcement policy. And um, board, uh, do you want Patrick or Russ or Mike to run through that again, or can everybody remember um, what they heard? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. OK, would anybody wish to start discussion or to make a motion to start discussion? I'll go ahead and uh, make a motion. Uh, I move that for the hospital budget review process, uh, we approve the hospital budget enforcement policy in the form presented to the board to be effective starting for fiscal year 2022. I'll second. And as I understand your motion, Robin, it would be a standing policy that um, would carry on into the future, but would start with fiscal year 22. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. So board discussion. I'll just hop in. Um, I think having a standing policy makes sense um, since it doesn't tend to change uh, very frequently. Certainly, if there were extraordinary circumstances in a given year, we could adopt a special policy, so it wouldn't pre pre prevent us from doing that or from waiving it in future years. So um, that's why I'm supportive of it. And in, I chose 2022 because I think, first of all, it provides uh, notice to the regulated entities uh, a little bit in advance, and I uh, am in favor of waiving enforcement for fiscal year 2021. Um, so that was also part of my thinking. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go on. Um, I think I've been pretty consistent on, on whether or not to waive. And um, I don't think we should waive enforcement for, for any given year. And really, I, I say that because enforcement is for if favorable or unfavorable. So, you know, I'd be more concerned about hospitals that maybe are going quite unfavorable and whether there was an opportunity for us to do anything to help them. You know, I, I would just, you know, don't think I don't think we need to waive enforcement, but 
that that's my point of view on that and i think we can always do that at a later time as well as we have in the you know as we did this past year um but i, I know last year i was consistent with that as well it was it's just not that we're going to in this way of course it's more to again be helpful and um there, there may be chances uh where we have that opportunity to meet with the hospitals or get information from them and maybe there's a way to react um if we don't have it then there's we kind of don't have that formal option so are you looking to amend the motion maureen uh, i'll put it out there for discussion i i know where this went last time so <laughs> It was, it was a 4 one I was the only one that that felt that way. I, I just don't want it to go unsaid. And again, enforcement, people always look at it negatively for those hospitals that are above the number. But when you read the language, it's above or below. And um, you know, I think in this case, most if anything, the hospitals would be below again because there's nothing we can do but if there was any way to to intervene and make any changes and have hospitals come and talk about that um it goes both ways, so. just to clarify maureen um if a hospital is say underperforming not meeting their budget targets and they would like to request a rate increase mid-year or have some sort of mid-year budget adjustment uh, voting for this motion would not preclude that opportunity from the hospitals coming forward and and adjusting mid-year or right or yeah it wouldn't it wouldn't preclude, preclude that I think it just um, there would be we would get information from the hospitals based on their year-end information we would make decisions whether there was anything that we wanted to do but no it doesn't preempt that so Is there a second to um, the motion to amend the motion? Sorry, I just want to make sure I understand. So the, the amendment would be to approve the policy effective fiscal year 2021. That's the way I'm understanding Maureen's motion. Yeah, um, and I would just say I'm I'm happy to to do it that way uh, if that makes it if if people prefer that um, it does it does not preclude waiving 2021. And Robin, I'm in the same boat that you're in, and that uh, I would vote for this motion, but I would hope um, unless there's some truly compelling reason that there would be no enforcement for for this year. But I'm not opposed to uh, Maureen's suggestion. Other board members? I still haven't heard a second to uh, Maureen's uh, amendment to the motion. Well, it may be semantic, so why don't I accept Maureen's as a friendly amendment and then I'll do a second motion about waiver. OK, and does the seconder of the original motion accept it as a friendly amendment? Did I second it? I can't remember. <laughs> Who seconded it? I don't remember either. It might have been. I believe, I believe Why it was, don't yeah. I it? Why don't I restate it? So the motion would be for the hospital budget review process. The board approves the hospital budget enforcement policy in the form presented to the board to be effective starting for fiscal year 2021. And would somebody like to uh, second that since we don't have uh, someone owning that original second? So I can second it. OK, it's been moved and seconded. Um, for the hospital budget review process um, for the Green Mountain Care Board to approve the enforcement policy um, to be a standing policy in the form presented to the board to be effective starting for fiscal year 21. Is there discussion? Hearing that I would open it up to the public for any public comment on the motion before us regarding the enforcement policy. Jeff Tiemann. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm, I'm so if, if what's on the table is to 
apply enforcement to FY21, I guess I would just be confused as to why enforcement was waived for FY20, and we're still very much in the middle of an incredibly uncertain time. So why enforcement would be applied to 2021 is just a question. And then, and then a comment is that we, you know, I would just like to go on the record saying that given the, the uncertainty and the conditions we continue to face and the difficulty of budgeting in this environment, that the board actually waived both FY21 and FY22 enforcement um, because it's so difficult to budget. So a question and a comment, thanks. Thanks, Jeff, and I totally agree with you that budgeting for this year has been completely impossible. Um, but I think everyone knew that uh, coming in, that there were more questions than answers. And I think this is just not closing a door, um, at least from this board members. It's not my perspective that I would like to seek enforcement, but um, others can speak for themselves. Other comment from the public? Yeah, and I'll just clarify too. Uh, you know, for me, it's just um, there's a standing enforcement policy, and that enforcement policy will be out there, and, and that's what we've put forward here. Um, and then any waivers to that, um, whether that decision doesn't need to be made now, um, and that decision could be made in the future. And as you saw, we didn't do it this past year, and. Most likely, we will not do it for 21, but rather than um, give that up right now when who knows what's going to happen for the rest of the next six months in this year, and if there would be a need for that, again, positively or negatively, to be looking at uh, the hospital's performance and um, doing enforcement, which is not always a negative action. Um, is, is really where I was just gives the flexibility remains open. Is there other public comment? OK, back to the board for further discussion on the motion to um, adopt a standing enforcement policy um, starting in fiscal year 21 as presented to the board by staff. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. So um, for the uh, rules that uh, um, are established for um, these type of team meeting votes, I'll call on General Counsel Barber to call the roll. Member Holmes? <clears throat> no. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Easter? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. So let the record show it was a four to one vote to um, adopt the standing enforcement policy. So next, um, I'm going to ask Patrick if he could um, put back up the slide. Kevin, before you move on, I, I do want to move to waive enforcement for fiscal year 21 due to the uncertainty of the pandemic. So to me, like what I was suggesting, I was happy to amend it so that we could agree to a standing policy, but I do agree with waiving it now to provide certainty moving forward um, for fiscal year 21. So I believe that I just heard a motion from you, Member Lunge, to waive enforcement for fiscal year 21. Is that correct? Yes. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to waive enforcement for fiscal year 21. Board discussion? Hearing none, I'll open it up to any public comment on the specific motion. Hearing none, and just to be safe, I'm going to ask uh, General Counsel Barber to call the roll on the motion. Uh, Member Holmes? Yes. Member Yusufer? No. Member Lunge? 
Yes. Member Pelham. Yes. And Mr. Chair. Yes. And my apologies if I made that more complicated than it needed to be. I just thought that the standing versus the timing, it made sense to bifurcate those. OK, thank you, uh, Member Lange. Next, um, Patrick, I'm going to ask if you could um, call up the slide that shows other potential changes um, to um, the tables and the guidance. And if we could uh, start to go through those one one by one. Are you referring to the staff's items within the slide deck that could potentially be stripped from? Yes, I am. Oh, I apologize. I interpreted <laughs> that incorrectly. OK, here we are. OK, I think we're here, though. <laughs> OK, so let's start with um, the bridges tables and start a discussion on that. Doesn't seem to be a lot of thought one way or the other on the bridges table. Um, does a board member wish to make a motion? Um, well, I'll, I'll speak to the bridges table. I mean, you know, the bridges table to me is very helpful and I would think for the hospitals when they're going through to identify what the key drivers are the changes in. Um, budgets are always wrong and obsolete. Every number in there is a budget, but I mean, the, the actuals will be different from that. But when they build the budget, you still have the ability to build um, a bridge for what went in the budget to determine what the changes were in NPR and expenses and what the drivers were. And I, I think it's been, you know, for me, it's been um, something where it kind of clearly shows what those drivers are and how they get from one place to another. Um, I would, I would hope that when budgets are being prepared by hospitals, that that's something that they all look at and understand when they're building their budgets so that it, it shouldn't be that difficult to do that. That's kind of the drivers of what, how they built their budget. Again, it's always based on assumptions, but within those assumptions, you, you build in whether it's due to utilization, whether it's due to, to a change in commercial rate, you know, what the drivers are. So, so I think the, the tables are valuable and I think it should be part of a budget process um, and discipline in a budget process when they're putting those together. So that would be my point of view on the, on the bridges. I think it should be included. Other comments from the board? Yeah, if I could, I'd like to, uh join Maureen in that and uh, applaud Maureen for being the creator of, of, of this. I found the bridges to be a very helpful table to uh, to walk from one place to another um, in a very complicated environment of you know payers and moving parts. Uh, so it is something that I regularly use during hospital review. The others I didn't use as much, but that table I found valuable. Other comment from board members? Um, I guess I would just say that I look at all the four of these tables, um, some of which are new, some of which we've had uh, before. I find them all very helpful. And um, particularly, I think if we're really trying to understand utilization and trying to understand uh, in inflation um, as components to NPR growth over time, I think having those two tables is important. I think to Maureen and Tom's points, reconciliation table is really, really helpful. And to the point that we have been talking about earlier about understanding the movement towards value-based care of that fourth table, the value-based care table is important. Um, I also, so I, I think they're all very, very helpful and really uh, deepen my understanding of what's happening in hospitals and provides the justification for some of the charge requests and some of the NPR growth that the hospitals are making. Without those tables, I think it's harder to justify um, some of the requests if they're um, on the higher side. 
but I will say that, uh, you know, I recognize that there is, you know, a burden on hospitals right now. We are still in the middle of the pandemic. We're hopefully towards the end of the pandemic, but we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. So I guess I would throw out for discussion, um, and it applies to all the tables, um, perhaps that we could move the deadline of submission of these tables one more month, right? August 1st is a submission of these tables that would give some hospitals some room to be able to complete this work. It's helpful for us in the budget hearings. That'll be prior to those hearings. Um, and perhaps for hospitals that meet the presumptive approval parameters, you know, maybe there's some leeway there. Um, if they've met the 3.5 and the 3.5, then maybe there's less need to have that justification in the utilization and the inflation tables. So I guess I'm open to thinking differently about this. I'd probably prefer an August 1st deadline to omitting them all together because I think they're helpful. And I think that next year, it'd be good to be able to look back on, on this work um, to understand what were the predictions and what were the realities. And so that's, I find them all very helpful, but I'm open to sort of thinking differently about a deadline that might give the hospitals a little more wiggle room and timing, particularly we're hearing, you know, from our governor that we'll have a normal July 4th. So I hope that we will. <laughs> um, and maybe that would give them some time to complete this work. So I'll throw that out there. Other board members. Yeah, I would be open to moving the date as well. And and maybe there's, you know, maybe as we go through this, we can talk about all four tables if we're in agreement to, to keep those in there. You know, I also think that for, I hope that many hospitals, I hope half, you know, get, get in the, you know, presumptive and, and don't have to come in and present. Um, but I would like to still see the tables because that then helps for that carry forward, you know, particularly the, for those that, you know, we're not going to necessarily be speaking to. So let me use the prerogative of the chair in, in the purpose of which to be efficient. Is there anyone who wishes to make a motion to remove any of these four tables? I don't want to do that, but I do have a technical question when about one of the tables when it's appropriate. I think it would be appropriate now, Robin. Uh, do we need the vaccine clinics and testing table in order to determine whether or not someone's in the 3.5% uh, range if those things are exempted from the 3.5% range? I guess I don't think that anything like that has been exempted from the 3.5% range. So maybe I misunderstood the motion at that time. Or maybe I did. I, I, so what, I guess my question was in the written guidance, um, it was not, I guess it wasn't clear. This is raising the fact that it wasn't clear that when looking at the, the three and a half percent NPR for the purpose of waiving the hearing, whether or not the stated exemption in the written guidance that income from from COVID, these COVID related activities would not be counted in that 3.5 percent. So I, because that was in the written guidance, I in my mind had moved it into the hearing waiver piece as well, but maybe that's not what other people were thinking. Yeah, I, I would have included that as well. Me too. But I think, Robin, to your question right now, and, and Kevin, I don't know if you have a comment on, on whether it was in the 3.5, but um, whether or not we would still want that table, um, even if they're below the 3.5, I think it's still important to be able to see that, particularly as we're going to be bridging again year over year the next year. So, so if for a hospital, so maybe I misinterpreted what you're saying, but if for a hospital was, you know, it was one percent, it was it was a very large amount of their change, you know, um, we would want to be able to track. Is that something that continues the next year? Which it might, right? If we end up having to do this, uh, having to do vaccines every year for this, or or maybe it goes away. So I think having that reconciliation would still be important. Yeah, and I think my question was not very clear. Um, I was thinking that if we are waiving hearings by July 28th and Jess is proposing we get this table on August 1st, we would not have the information in the table in waiving in the hearing waiver analysis. So 
could, which I think is fine. I agree with you. It would be helpful to collect it, but I think that's fine for all of the tables. But I was, it seemed to me like we might need table five in order if, if our intent was that the 3.5 excluded any income from these activities, we would need to know the income, I think, before July 28th. Well, I think we, we want all those activities to have that income excluded. And I think we've made that clear in trying to work with um, the hospitals to try to make sure that um, it's, it's, it's not um, going to be a detriment to them um, revenues or expenses related to either testing or vaccination. Um, so in my mind, uh, I was thinking that um, Jess was proposing here on these specific tables and not uh, not referring to any other table. Got it. Okay. Sorry. I, and, I, I, I yeah, understand. Bob, maybe to clarify, maybe it shouldn't be August 1st, maybe it should be July 28th, because I think the pre pre presumptive approval right isn't it July 28th, it has to be in. So, so just for you know, it, it, the case that, it, it, you know, these tables could be done by July 28th, which would, then we wouldn't have to do a separate motion for those people that may be exempt. And, you know, I think the intent is there. And, um, and maybe the wink wink is if it came in August 1st, we're not going to penalize you if you if you weren't one that was getting exemption or something. But um, maybe it's July 28th. Just the, the July 28th deadline is our decision deadline. But I think, wasn't that when everything had to be sent in, though? Or no, that was just when yeah, we... Yeah, that's when we would July send in. Yeah. Okay, but maybe July 28th is the, is the date for that, or, or we could talk about what those hospitals would have to provide for the exemption. So, Mr. Chair, can I, may I jump in? You may. So I'm thinking about this from a future logistical perspective, and I think the... <clears throat> The thought that maybe we accept this information at a later date is going to cause some issues with presenting the full package on the 28th for the board to consider who may be exempt and who may not. We have to have everything prepared by that date for your decision. So if we push some of these items off, then the exemption that you've approved already, um, it's not meeting the spirit of the requirements in the documents to um, meet all guidance requirements and amongst others um, be reasonable because all of this builds into that equation. So if we move that date back, I think we're potentially going to create a mess for that uh, July 28th potential decisioning on exemptions. And, and the, you know, I'll just make another comment, which is we might think we're being helpful. I mean, if assuming we keep these tables in, which, which seems kind of like the direction we were going, we might think we're being helpful saying they could delay submission of these tables. But in reality, as they're preparing their budgets, they probably, they, they need, if they know they need to do the tables, it's going to have to be supporting of their budget and they would probably be doing them at that time. If I were doing it, I would do them at the time I was preparing that budget and reconciliation, you know, with, with my staff rather than, you know, do it a month later, even though I totally understand the intent was to try to help them out. We, you know, we might find if we pulled 14 of the hospitals, 12 of them would say, if I have to do it, I'm going to do it when I submit for July 1, it's not going to really help me to delay it because I'm going to have to track back to that, those numbers. So um, I think it's kind of part and parcel that if, if we need them, um, you know, and, and, and unless um, when we go for comment, we hear differently, again, assuming they have to do them, I'm not sure it's helpful to delay. I'm going to ask Mike Barber as the parliamentarian if there was any motion that was on the table. I did not hear one. Thank you. I didn't either, but I just wanted to be uh, clear on that. So well, and can I just add one thing, Kevin? Do we need a motion if it's something we were, it was already in there and we had to prove it? This is it. exactly what I was about to say, Maureen. Yeah. I'm thinking <laughs> we don't really need a motion. We were talking right. about changing it. We're not. So rather than confuse and have a motion, it that's, might just be. That's like exactly it. what I was going to say, that, okay. it, that hearing no motion, that um, the language would uh, stay intact. Does anybody wish to make a motion regarding these? 
Hearing none, I'm going to uh, move to the discussion on um, the capital investment uh, cycle section and uh, the, the, the discussion here should be on whether we um, keep as originally presented um, the adaptive submission, which would include the capital expenditure sheets, but to reduce the narrative component in the capital investment cycle section of the submission. Discussion from the board? So this is Robin. I, I personally, I, I can do without the as much in the narrative this year, given the circumstances. Um, obviously, at some point, the capital investment cycle is going to really be an important issue, given that we did see many capital projects pushed out into the future, and some of those may be getting uh, more urgent. So I'd be in favor of streamlining the questions. Would anybody wish to make a motion for the point of discussion? Sure. Uh, I move that we um, sorry, I'm looking looking at the actual language right now in the guidance. Whether you call it streamline or reduce narrative component, I think either way, Robin gets okay. to the same thing. I was trying to be a little more specific so it was clear on what we were actually reducing or streamlining. But I, for purposes of discussion, at least, I'll move that we um, streamline the questions in the capital investment cycle section of the guidance. I'll second. Just to be clear, and we would be keeping um, the the um, adaptive submission, including the capital expenditure sheets. Yes, I haven't really heard any public comment or other suggestion that we shouldn't keep those. I just want to make sure we're all clear. OK, um, board discussion. Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public discussion on the motion to um, keep as originally uh, presented the adaptive submission, including the capital expenditure sheets, but to streamline the narrative component in capital investment cycle section. Public comment. And yes, I see a hand raised from Mark Stanislaus. Hi, Chair Mullen. Uh, let me share my camera. I think I am. This is just more of a technical um, question. Um, nothing about with well, a motion, but this is one of the areas specifically on the Capitol. If we could have more time to submit the adaptive numbers, it would be very helpful because that detail is something that you do kind of fill in, um, you know, sometimes at a later date or the tail end. So I would just put that out there for consideration. Um, um, you know, there's no objection to the motion as it is, but, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, creating time, um, unless that capital is used to make the decision, um, if we could have more time to submit that capital detail in adaptive, I think it would provide the hospital some relief. Thank you, Mark. Is there other public discussion? Public comment? Hearing none, um, is there further discussion among the board? I was wondering if Patrick had thoughts on Mark's suggestion to push it out. I, I, I look at it, I would say, at a higher level in terms of thinking about um, margin and that kind of thing, but I'm not sure that, that I would necessarily need it for the waiver of the hearing. So I could... Personally, I could see pushing that piece out, but I would appreciate uh, what the staff might think. Patrick? Yes, board member Lunge, I agree with you. I, I don't think it's something that's going to be pertinent to that July 28th presentation. There's a lot of detail there. 
Um, and it really is more for <clears throat> the narrative component anyway for them to build their story around. So I would also look back to Mr. Stanislaus for an idea on what type of extension um, their hospital and others may seek. I think it would be ideal to have that information at or around the time of those um, July 28th hearings, so prior to August 1st, but I would um, cordially request that they provide us with some input on uh, what type of extension they would be seeking. Mark, can you answer that question at this time? Yeah, I mean, um, I think any extension is helpful. So, you know, if it's the July 28th or August 1st, you know, that does provide some, you know, relief. If, say, I think back to last year's cycle, I don't think we submitted this information until October. So, you know, I would just put that in perspective, but any relief that the board can provide is, is, is you know, would be gratefully appreciated. Robin, did you want to uh, um, amend your motion or stay with the existing motion? Uh, I'm happy to amend it unless you'd rather deal with it as two separate issues. Do you have a preference? I'd rather get it over with in one swoop, but. Okay, then I will uh, move, amend my motion uh, to um, streamline the narrative section relating to capital investment cycle in the guidance and to extend the time to submit the adaptive numbers uh, related to capital investments uh, until um, July. I, I'm going to just pick a random date, <laughs> but may, actually, may, what do you think, Kevin, about if I say that we delegate to the staff to work out an extension on the submission of the adaptive numbers and that way they can work that out. Yeah, I, th I think you could make that motion. I mean, in my mind, I don't think we even need to have it by July 28th. I could even envision extending this to September 1st, but that's that's just in my mind. So others may have a, a more pressing reason why we should have this information before the 28th of July. So. Um, it's whatever you wish to make as your motion. Okay, so uh, then my motion is going to be to streamline the capital investment cycle narrative and uh, delegate uh, the authority to staff to um, extend the time for the submission of the adaptive numbers relating to capital investments. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. It's been moved by member Lunge and seconded by member Holmes. Um, is there further board discussion? My dog apparently has something to say about the issue. If not, I'll, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Okay, so uh, I believe that um, we are next to a discussion on um, NPR, FPP, and on um, uh, charge growth request. And I noticed that uh, it is the lunch hour. I do think we're making really good progress. Um, I would be inclined to continue to try to uh, move forward and get things finished, but I want to be sensitive to uh, other board members. So um, does any board member wish to um, recess at this time for lunch or would you prefer to proceed? I'm happy to proceed, but I could use a five minute bio break. So, um, I am going to put this meeting in recess for 10 minutes just to make sure that everybody has a chance to uh, get that bio break. And we will be back at 1215. And before we go, um, this might be the appropriate time to wish one of our board members a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, Maureen. Happy birthday. Okay, the meeting is recessed until 1215. 
Happy <laughs> birthday. I'm worried about you, Maureen. <laughs> yeah, because I got a better group to spend it with on my birthday, but no, thank you. <laughs> okay, see everybody back at 1215. Welcome back to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. Just to uh, confirm, I'm going to call the roll of the board just to make sure that everyone is back. Um, Jessica Holmes. Yes. Robin Lunch. Yes. Tom Pelham. Here. And Maureen Usper. Yes. Great. So we're going to resume and um, we're looking at the NPR FPP growth guidance for 2022 for discussion. Sure, one thing, you know, I had put out before potentially to consider is the three and a half percent budget to budget NPR FPP growth um, or higher if supported by utilization shifting from prior years. So we would expect um, that would would expect then to have some type of bridge above if if a hospital came higher than three and a half percent to be bridging that with utilization that had shifted from prior years. Okay, other board members. Does any board member wish to make a motion for the purposes of jump starting this conversation? Sure. I don't know, Patrick, do you have motion language anywhere or is it just that? Uh, so, for the fiscal year 22 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board establishes a net patient revenue fixed perspective payment growth of 3.5% over the hospital's fiscal year 21 approved budget for NPR FPP um, with the ability to go higher than 3.5% if supported by utilization shifting from prior years. Is there a second to the motion? I will second it for the purposes of discussion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to um, move that for the 2022 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board establishes a net patient revenue fixed perspective payment growth guidance of 3.5% over the hospital's fiscal year 2021 approved budget for NPR FPP with the understanding that the request can be higher um, subject to utilization. Maureen, do I have that wording correct? Yes, yeah, subject from utilization shifting from prior years. Board discussion. So I guess my question is, um, I think like it makes sense to me that certainly we may see some utilization shift, but I, I'm not sure how we know if it's utilization that's shifted from prior years versus new utilization. So I, I guess my hesitation, uh, uh, my sort of hesitation in what I wanted to kind of talk through is I think, you know, since this is guidance, the hospitals have the ability to request higher than 3.5 for any reason. Um, and certainly I think what you're maybe trying to do, Maureen, is signal an understanding that there may be some pent up demand out there. Um, I'm just wondering whether it, it, they're having it explicit in that way makes it harder for them to justify in a way because it kind of implies that other sorts of reasons aren't acceptable, which I think um, certainly there could be other justifications that were acceptable. So that was why I was hesitating and why I wanted to kind of talk it through. So Robin, are you suggesting a friendly amendment to member use for that would be um, 
after um, the motion um, calling for um, the language saying that um, hospitals may um, request a higher NPR FPP growth ceiling, removing the language subject to utilization um, from previous years? Sure. I was just trying to make sure I understood, <laughs> but yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy to propose that. So basically, I think what your the proposal that she's asking you to consider, Maureen, is the language that's on the slide with the caveat at the end um, that says um, that acknowledges the fact that hospitals may request um, a higher NPR FPP um, growth um, number um, subject to um, their demonstration of that need, I guess would be the language. Yeah, and I guess my um, my my question there would be, you know, then I think it's going to get to where where we may have a motion from another board member at some point, which is going to have you know no no guidance, right? Because that that to me starts going on to the to the no guidance if it's three and a half, but you know if there wasn't any specific piece there. So I'm not sure how that would differ from not having necessarily a guidance because we always have the flexibility to, and we have shown historically every year, not just in the pandemic, that we've reviewed each hospital's individual situation and made um, recommendations based on that. Um, so here I was, I understand what Robin's saying, you know, is it clear and black and white that you know this moved from one year to the next and and to, to identify that but i think what is has been clear is that certainly we're operating in a time where hospitals are still not back to to normal as as far as what what's happening and um you know people have been delaying care for things that could end up shifting into the next year. And so that was, you know, a potential reason to go over three and a half. So I get what you're saying, Bob, and I guess I'm just not, um, I would throw it out in the discussion that it's um, it's really not, not really having potentially a guidance ceiling. It's just saying we're going to look at each hospital based on the, you know, circumstances that they're in um, to, to identify what the NPR would be. To me, it's almost a matter of uh, semantics because I think that um, this board has historically demonstrated that it will listen to each hospital as an individual story. So I don't share your same concerns, Maureen, that this just throws out uh, no ceiling because I think that um, it it's there never has been a true ceiling. We, we've always been willing to listen to the individual stories of each of the hospitals. So, to me, um, I just think that uh, what Robin is suggesting is just consistent with what we've always done. But I'll leave it to okay. you whether or not you want to accept it. No, I'll, I'll accept the amendment so we can continue. Yeah. Okay. Board discussion? So uh, can you repeat the amendment, the amended version of this again? So it's the language that you see on your screen with a clause at the end um, that um, just clarifies that the Green Mountain Care Board will hear each hospital budget submission as an individual story and a request higher than um, the 3.5 would be considered. Tom, did you want to say anything? I can. Well, I, I, I'm just trying to. I mean, it's I. I for me, I think I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. You know, on on the one hand, um, as we know through rate review, the hospitals use um, uh, the uh, insurers use hospital approved budgets as a driver for their their rate increases, um, and I think that you know in the overall system. It is structured. I, I have a quote here from Mr. 
uh, Mr. Abram said last year when during his appeal, he, um, uh, he they, he basically said, you know, under the all payer model, the commercial rate must quote solve for the lack of increases in our reimbursements from public payers. And so it just it's it's this embedded logic, you know, that the uh, <clears throat> prime premium payer, the uh, um, co-payment and uh, uh, and deductible are kind of the last resort for making up a budget. And so and I, I, I get that, but I'm also on the one hand seeing, you know, a uh, or $34 million uh, under budget in 2020 for um, DIVA, uh, a level funding um, of reimbursement rates in 2021. Um, the general fund revenues, as I said earlier, are coming in at 46 million so far. And this is just since uh, uh, January 19th uh, at $46 million over target. Um, uh, the, as required by law, the uh, an increase in one one percent increase in reimbursement rates costs about five million bucks in general fund, and I'm and and then you've got this two point seven billion dollars coming in as well, and so I'm I'm just I'm trying to find a way to deal with hospitals on a case by case basis and deal with the facts um, that they face um, at 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 the local level. But at the same time, to to break this syndrome of us relying on premium payers, co-payments, and uh, and and higher and higher deductibles to kind of make up the difference for for uh, what uh, is, and Medicare we can't really control, but Medicaid the state can control. So that's 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 where I get lost. I um, you know I I I, I don't like voting for a blank check um, when I think the system is just taking the insurance, um, people who have private insurance, whether on the uh, exchange or not, it takes them for granted as the payer of last resort. I hear you, Tom. I think, but if, let's say, hypothetically, the hospitals lobby the legislature and the legislature says, yeah, we have this Medicaid money, let's increase it, that would be present in an NPR FPP number two. So well, yeah, to right. the right. argument right. is more applicable to the charge component of the discussion. And I certainly did not see my language as doing anything more than clarify the existing process and certainly didn't see it as a blank check. So. Well. Um, I, I that, that's my dilemma. I, I, you know, it, there's definitely a dilemma here, I can, and I can't, it, I can't fix it <laughs> from from this position. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, I, you know, uh, it's it's the kind of thing that at one point in my career I probably could have fixed this, but I, yeah, I can't, I can't do it here. But I, I don't like being complicit. I, I don't like being complicit in knowing that there's billion, literally billions of dollars out there in this domain this year and um we're having a process that is is uh um in, in, encourages the cost shifts encourages as i said premium payers and and uh, deductibles etc as the payer of last resort it's a <laughs> it's a set of horns for me i i i don't like being in this position because it is not fair. It is not a fair place to be. Well, I guess what was, is any different than in years past where we've always been willing to come in and um, let hospitals tell their individual stories, Tom? Well, I, and uh, what is different? Uh, um, nothing. I, 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 I want them to come in. I want to hear. I just wish that some of their fire uh, maybe wasn't directed so much against us, which we've seen some of that, you know, in the media and, and in some letters so that some of their fire was directed at where the money is. Follow the money. Um, it's, uh, you know, every every five million dollars is uh, a one percent increase in Medicaid rates. And 
um, they were under budget um, for fiscal 20 by $34 million. So there are solutions out here that, uh, um, that uh, and alternatives to having this cost shifted onto insurers. And I'm just speaking up as uh, urging the hospitals to go where the money is, especially in these, you know, in, in this period of time. Isn't that what uh, Willie Sutton said when they asked him why he robbed banks? He said that's that's because that's where the money is. Yeah, well, so, there's a lot of a lot of wisdom there. So <laughs> I would just say that uh, I don't think we here at the Green Mountain Care Board are going to fix government uh, funding, and um, I think that uh, um, I'm not sure if this whole discussion on the NPR FPP growth guidance. Um, necessarily um, falls into that discussion. I think we need to continue to push to um, make sure that everything that uh, every increase that uh, occurs in the healthcare system doesn't just fall on the backs of the commercial ratepayers. But I, I think that uh, the discussion here is probably getting a little bit um, more far range than uh, what's necessary. No, I agree with that. I mean, a, a, I think a, a fixed percentage increase, which I'm not recommending, would 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 help fix it. And it's uh, and we also have rate review. That's the other side of the equation in terms of 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 managing this. But it's 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 it's, it's, it's at some point it's going to implode. Um, Kevin, can I hop in here, maybe? Uh, and um. And I appreciate Tom, your concerns about the cost shift. I share them, uh, and hopefully, maybe we can address that through some of our sustainability planning uh, work that we're doing. At least understanding how much of it is exists, and and are there ways to um, mitigate some of that. But uh, I, I think this probably isn't going to surprise you all. But I uh, I still feel I think still from last week that given the uncertainty due to the pandemic, I prefer not to put. Uh, the language has changed, right? We started with targets, then we went to ceilings, and now it's guidance. Um, and I think it feels a little like semantics to me. Uh, it's still suggesting to the hospitals that you meet this fill in the blank. Although I know I recognize that we always um, leave room for individual case by case conversations about where hospitals are. In my mind, um, I think we've signaled where we hope hospitals can land with our presumptive approval criteria. But beyond that, I feel like I just want to hear where hospitals are, uh, what they think their most realistic, most appropriate budget to serve the needs of their communities are without trying to uh, fit hospitals in this box with this guidance or this target or this ceiling or wh whatever we're going to call it. Um, so for me, I feel like the presumptive uh, approval criteria works really well for signaling our, our aspirational hopes to where, where hospital budgets will be. But beyond that, I, I'm going to vote no, even though I actually want to share with both Robin and Maureen my appreciation for your trying to actually add wiggle room into the motion to allow for that. I think my preference is simply to just say, if you don't meet the presumptive approval, I would like to see your budget and we'll look at it on a case by case basis, given the needs in your community. So, and that will actually, so I don't have to repeat myself when we get to the charge, that will also be my position, I think, unless I'm, you know, in the conversation, uh, I feel the same way about that for the charge conversation. So I appreciate your perspective, uh, Jess. I do think that, uh, um, Based on the current motion, though, it's not really that much different than what you're saying um, in that uh, it's still giving the latitude, which hospitals have always had historically at the Green Mountain Care Board, to come in and make their case on why they need a higher amount. And I suspect that we'll have several that will come in and make their case on why they need that higher amount. And I suspect that we'll approve several of those requests. But I... I, I don't think that uh, there's anything um, in the current motion that's in front of us that really is any different than a motion that um, you suggested last week, other than it, it's just a, a wording semantic, but that's just my opinion. Is there other discussion from the board? 
Yes, I have just one question. Um, so, like, I'm looking at the uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, total system wide uh, budgeted FTP for 2020 and was $2.717 billion. And the actual came in at uh, $2.425 uh, billion. And so, um, so does that, um, does that mean that, and, and so during those two, during 2020 and, and uh, 2021, some of that capacity wasn't used, obviously. And it, so is it that built, and since we're going, you know, budget year to budget year, is that unused capacity built into the base of the proposal for um, 2022? So, Tom, um, the, the answer to your question is that this this guidance is referring to budget to budget and that um, in the case where those hospitals that did not um, recognize in advance a, de a decline in revenue and a decline in uh, volume um, that they foresaw for the 21 year, that it would be off their budget so that I think that's part of the individual stories that we will hear. We may hear a hospital say, well, we realistically came in and our forecast um, was more accurate than others. And at the time, everybody probably thought that their forecast was the most accurate. Nobody has had a crystal ball a year ago. Nobody has a crystal ball today. Everyone made their best foot forward with their budget presentation and it just will find we'll find that some will prove to be more accurate than others but this guidance is from budget to budget not actual no i i, I understand that i it's just it's budget to budget with some of the capacity not having been used uh, in prior years um but correct. it's still being carried forward in, into the capacity is being carried forward in their npr i, I get that yeah. Other board comments? So at this point, I'm going to open it up to public comment on the motion before us regarding NPR FPP growth guidance. Members of the public? Jeff Tiemann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't sure if I effectively raised my hand. Um, I, I just wanted... went up at the top, but it didn't go up next to your name at first. So I'm having some um, weird computer things going on today. <laughs> okay. Well, well, as, as long as we can hear each other now, thank you. Um, I, I just I want to start by saying I'm encouraged by the the direction of the motion and this conversation, um, and want to thank the board for their thoughtful approach here. I'm particularly supportive of. Uh, board member Holmes, um, as she articulated her approach, because I think it allows the hospitals to develop the budget they need without artificial constraints and then allows the board to evaluate each organization on its merits individually. Um, th that said, I do want to just reiterate a couple of Mike Del Treco's very well mentioned points earlier, um, acknowledging the unique moment we're in and the importance of looking not only to historical growth averages, but also to some of the other circumstances here, like the critical importance of margins. Hospitals are constantly working to control costs and ensure their stability, um, but shouldn't be asked to do that by pushing margins and, and expenses to the breaking point. And I think the national scene is a helpful, um, if, if sort of distressing illustration. There was a Kaufman Hall report, um, Mr. Chair, that I think was shared with you um, that said by the end of 2021, calendar year 2021, hospital margins could, could be um, down 80% from pre-pandemic levels. Um, and the last thing we need to do is find sort of additional ways to, to squeeze margins or force hospitals to do more with less. Um, I, don't, I don't think we create an affordable healthcare system by, by minimizing margins. And um, doing that would just sort of create an, an insufficient um, system that's ill-equipped to manage day-to-day -day responsibilities, let alone a pandemic. And, and I think the pandemic has taught us how important and vital our hospitals are, and that their financial strength is critical when they're trying to manage a major crisis and serve public health. So for those reasons, um, and lots of others, like improving aging facilities, 
um, workforce challenges, text, uh, teaching the next generation of doctors, um, and investing in health reform um, when we weren't given transformation dollars that were promised. We need the capacity to grow responsibly um, at a rate that's more closely correlated with the reality on the ground in medical inflation than any arbitrary limit or ceiling. And, and, that, and that includes um, a new cap on, um, on rates when you already have the ability within your purview to manage that through NPR and other mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, all members of the board are in possession of the Kaufman Hall report. And uh, we thank uh, um, Steve Gordon um, for sending it to us. We already had it, but um, it doesn't hurt to make sure that we have things. So I'm um, very appreciative of uh, Steve's uh, effort to get that information to us. Um, other members of the public? And I see Mike Fisher's hand is up. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, I, um, I put my hand down. Um, I can't resist uh, to at least want to respond to some of the cost shift discussion. I also recognize that it is not really what is being discussed in front of you right now. So um, uh, with this short interruption to say, um, I would be happy to talk with board members or uh, talk more at length about some questions I have about this concept of a one-to-one, -one, um, uh, that the cost shift works in the way that people talk about it uh, at a later date and, um, and uh, hold myself short uh, to allow you to continue to talk about the, uh, what's really being discussed. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. Other members of the public? Hearing, oh, did somebody start to say something? Uh, Mike, if you could just mute yourself, I think it's coming from your end. I don't see any other hands raised and I'm not hearing anything. So just to repeat for the board that the motion before you is for the fiscal year 2022 hospital budget review process. The Green Mountain Care Board establishes a net patient revenue slash fixed perspective payment NPR FPP growth guidance of 3.5% 3 over the hospital's fiscal year 21 approved budget for NPR slash FPP with the understanding that any hospital may come before the board to ask for a higher amount um, given their ability to demonstrate it. And I'm going to ask uh, um, General yeah, can, oh, Sorry, ahead. can I just suggest that it it's probably a, a different amount, right? Because they could also ask for a lower amount. Well, I, I thought that was explicit, but it may not be. In any case, I think that, you know, the staff can wordsmith it. I, I don't think anybody uh, um, thought otherwise, but... Um, I agree with you. It's always better to be explicit. So thank you, Robin. With that, I'm going to ask uh, General Counsel Barber to call the roll. Uh, Board Member Lunch. Yes. Uh, Member Pelham. Yes. Member Usper. Yes. Member Holmes. No. Mr. Chair. Yes. So let the record show it was a four to one vote. And Patrick, if you could move the slide to the discussion on the charge growth. And maybe you could go straight to the, the language piece, Patrick, of the motion. For the purposes of discussion, does anybody wish to uh, uh, make comments from the board or to offer a motion? I have a comment I'd like to make, which is, um, I. so for me, I think 
the, the reason why I was interested in uh, providing guidance around charges this year is, uh, quite frankly, last year we got a lot of pushback from the hospitals that there was no, uh, no guidance about it. Um, and so, you know, I'm of a couple minds here because certainly we haven't always had explicit percentage growth guidance around charges in the past. Um, so, you know, to that extent, I don't feel like I absolutely have to have it this year. Um, but I, I do feel like it's responsive to the request for more from the discussion last year around how it would have been helpful to have uh, some general guidance on that. So, um, and so I'm, I'm interested to hear where, what other people are thinking and uh, certainly the public comment around it. But for me, like, I think it is helpful to include it because it does sort of give a sense of direction. Again, it is guidance and we would fully expect some hospitals to come in with a different amount, higher or lower based on to Maureen's point earlier, what, um, what they feel is necessary. And to Tom's point earlier, um, you know, it, it, it is a frustrating uh, exercise where you really have this one lever that disproportionately impacts a relatively small part of the Vermont population when uh, inflationary increases should be more widely shared across the entire population. Other board members? Yeah, I support what, what Robin was saying as far as, and, and um, people may forget last year, some of the hospitals, you know, did did bring up that we had didn't have guidance and they, they felt, you know, maybe that would have been helpful. I'm open to to being flexible with, with either putting a number or not in here and and maybe we just need to be uh, i think maybe where the disconnect has been is um kind of the statements that have come back at us like i'm, I'm at my npr so if i have this really high commercial rate ask that that's okay because i met the npr and i think that's that's kind of you know why we were contemplating whether we put in guidance but maybe there's a way to at least be more explicit that we will be looking at commercial rate ass and potentially making adjustments. And I think, you know, one, one of the pieces we haven't talked a lot about, um, we, you know, we've talked obviously the cost shift and, we, you know, we've talked about inflationary pressures at the hospitals and we've talked about, you know, the need to be able to provide, you know, the quality care that we need and we all want that. What we keep missing in the piece is that many people aren't going for care because they can't afford insurance or they can't afford their deductibles that we have. So that's that's kind of the, the, the dilemma and the crossroads we have. I'm not saying hospitals are not considering that, but we hear it from both sides where people you know, are going to get rate increases or they get rate increases, they go to high deductible plans, they don't get care because they can't afford it. So we can't give them quality care if they can't afford to go there. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why we tried to put in um, last year, you know, the ability to ask for a higher rate, put it in in this bifurcated, which, you know, which we didn't do as a bifurcated rate because of the issue of not being able to potentially get COVID relief money for that if it was set up that way. But that was the intent. Um, I understand, you know, with everything still going on, um, probably can't hold, you know, that will be a consideration, I think, when we look at a hospital for what they're requesting in 22, but I, I, I don't see that we're going to have an explicit motion to say we'll reduce for that. But I just think, you know, that that's kind of just the miss in this, right? I mean, we certainly could have hospitals that come again, again in 22, asking for double-digit rate increases um, to get them financially healthy. They need to be financially healthy. But on the other hand, the large, vast majority of the commercial consumers are not financially healthy and can't afford to get care and they're getting priced out of the market. So, you know, and this gets built in these increases, 
year over year and they compound. So last year we had some pretty big increases that are built in and then now we're going to go again. So so I know we're all working together to try to get the strong healthcare system and I think the intent of all of us is to do that. It's just that you know that's that's kind of the dilemma. So I guess um you know, I could be okay with not putting a specific number in and just, you know, putting something in the language that says we're certainly going to look at what the commercial ask is and, you know, be considering what the burden is on the consumers as well. So, Thanks, Maureen. I'll, I'll jump in here and just offer my thoughts. Um, again, I think that the board has always historically um, listened to any request and based it upon the information that the hospital presents in the presentation. And for me, I would prefer to see a number in here. And the number that um, I would like to see in this is 3.5%. And the reason for that is if you take it and uh, exclude last year, historically, um, the charges have been growing just over uh, 3%. And so I think three and a half um, is a good number for this. But I also recognize that there are going to be some stories that we're going to hear that are going to be able to justify the need for a higher increase in order to have a sustainable institution moving forward. But I, I believe strongly that there should be a number here because I think that um, lacking a number, I think uh, the message could be misconstrued. Other board members? Well, I agree with you, Kevin. I think that some guidance is better than no guidance. Um, and, uh, you know, the, um, you know, obviously if, if, if it needs to go higher, given the realities of a specific hospital, then that's what should happen. But um, I think having a number um, that uh, is tied to the economy, which this 3.5% is, is a better place to be than not having any number at all. Other board members, or does anyone wish to make a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll move. Uh, I'll move that for the fiscal year 2022 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board establishes charge request growth guidance of 3.5% over the hospital's fiscal year 2021 approved charge increase. Is there a second? Well, hearing none, but also recognizing that uh, I typically uh, do not wish to make a second as the chair. I understand that it is a, a prerogative that I have. I'm going to second the motion for the peer, for the purposes of discussion. So board members, other board members. So, as I said, I mean, I can go with a number, but I'm, I think I'm probably at four. Um, just because I think that given the uncertainties around utilization, three and a half is low this year. Um, although I certainly recognize why other folks would go with that number. So, um, that's why I didn't second the motion. So it may very well be low, but my point would be that we're we're allowing flexibility and people could come in at a much higher number and we'll likely approve numbers that are higher than this. But um, I, I just uh, think back to what Maureen commented about uh, the higher um, approved charges last year, which at the beginning were somewhat uh, thought to a piece of them to be um, a, a one-time limited duration only increase, and that is not the case, and that we're, we're moving this base forward um, to a time when hopefully utilization is back to normal, and that is um, somewhat troubling to me. I, I agree as well. I mean, I don't disagree with those thoughts. You know, I, I am also troubled by building it into the base. 
Other board members? Hearing none, I'll open it up to the public for public comment on the motion. And I see Mike Del Treco's hand up, Mike. Uh, thanks, Chair Mullen and board um, for the conversation here. I, I think the um, proposal on the table should contemplate what fiscal year 20 net revenue performance actually did. It did a couple of things. One, it helped us meet the goals of our all payer model, the 3.5 per capita spend. So having $290 million net revenue shortfall helps in that in, in that arena. The, the second thing it did, and um, I'm, I want to be sensitive here because I, I understand this might not be um, widely liked. It, it changed the payment levels of our insurance companies. We, we all um, know that that net patient, net patient revenue shortfall um, created some savings in that space. So to move from 21 budget to 22 budget creates this potential windfall. We all know that we all received a rebate from our car insurance companies because of those savings. We didn't see that from healthcare insurance, and this would only perpetuate that savings. And I know you do look at that. So um, again, I say that with uh, a great sensitivity to um, my colleagues in the insurance companies. Um, so I, I just think we have to think about more um, more specifics around what this what this uh, proposal does and how it actually impacts uh, the industry. I and this isn't a shot at my employer. I have a high deductible plan, and I know I look at my out of pocket and I say, "Geez, am I going to go in or not?" And I say that so I'm, I'm marrying all these things together, and I and I just think the whether it's three and a half or four percent, it doesn't recognize. The burden that these uh, our our organizations are carrying going into into next year, um, and I'd prefer to see no uh, no ceiling or no guidance here, and allow you to judge um, both all of the all of the aspects, including net revenue and rate, when you get their budgets. So thank you. Thank you, Mike, and I do think that regardless of whether there's a number or there's not that we will take all, all factors into consideration uh, in trying to make the best uh, possible decisions during the uh, budget uh, process time. Other public comment? Uh, yes, uh, Mark Stanislaus. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think first of all, I would go back to the overarching um, message that the hospitals have been saying. Um, there's been a lot of detail out there and there's no need to rehash the detail, but I think the hospitals are almost begging or pleading to say, how do we engage each other differently? And if we're gonna find the path forward together, we need to find that. And, and you know, the answer is, well, the fix isn't gonna be exactly what happens in FY22. But the fix is going to allow us to engage in the conversation on how we use FY22 as something with the bridge to. And given all of the unique circumstances that we talked about that COVID has thrown at all of us, and there's no easy answer here on any side of this equation, but this is, this is a new item to a process that we believe is already overly burdensome. So if the guidance is, is how do we have more conversation about that? I think that's how do we move this forward together? If the conversation is what is the cap or what is the number? I would say, you know, we should think about this, how it aligns with the all payer model process. There was a conversation that our way forward is through reform and how do we increase FPP? And, and in the all payer model, when we look at that 3.5%, that's not met for any single payer. And to clarify the comments of Dr. Brumstead earlier, well, that were referenced, 
it was referring to how the all payer model works and 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 that relates to us as the regulators as a whole that have signed up for that the providers that have signed up for that the hospitals that are participating with their providers in that is that's the way forward and in the solve for that three and a half percent overall isn't meant for any one payer so you know at least in this year here more particularly than ever let's make this about how do we engage in a conversation about how do we move forward together because the other thing that i think there is a compounding issue with rates that Maureen said. And I worry about what those compounding issue, issues on rates created in the margin change from 17 to 18 to 19 to 20. And there's no easy fix. And there's, you can speak to both sides of this candidly. Okay? But if there's ever a year to make this about a conversation, and to bring the hospitals and the regulators and the insurers together, let's take this FY22 process to do that. And I think putting a number in this slide, even though it's a reference or a guidance, I don't think it will bring us closer together because we'll focus on that number. And preferably let's focus on the conversation and the decision process will lead to where it leads, as it always has. So, you know, I would just put that out there for consideration by this board. And I'm probably making these comments less, less as a University of Vermont Health Network and employee and more as an individual of St. Albans, Vermont, born and raised here in Vermont, raised our kids here in Vermont, our kids are going to college in Vermont. Um, and using my 25 plus years of healthcare experience of how do we move something forward together? And I just don't think putting a percentage in this slide helps us move forward together. Let's move forward together through a conversation. And if you want to put language in there about, if you, you know, about how do we pull this together, you know, um, that probably makes sense, okay? Um, and like I'm saying, I'm speaking as an individual of St. Albans, Vermont, not an employee of the University of Vermont Health Network, but I really think putting a percentage in here doesn't draw those conversations closer. And I worry about it might create a little more separation. So I would prefer to go into this process of pulling us together and how do we use 22 as a transition, you know, because it's not going to be fixed in one year. Candidly. So how do we use 22 as the conversation to say bridge into something different? And that bridge into something different is moving more towards FPP. So the closer, the closer we can align those arrangements, um, the better. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share my personal thoughts. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate that. Other members of the public? Other members of the public? Hearing none, um, back to the board discussion. Any further board comment? Hearing none, I'm going to ask Michael Barber to um, call the roll on the motion for the fiscal year 2022 Hospital budget review process. The Green Mountain Care Board establishes charge request charge request growth guidance of 3.5 percent over the hospital's fiscal year 2021 approved charge increase, with the recognition that any hospital may come in and present a case for a different charge request growth rate. Mike? Sure. Uh, Member Holmes? No. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Lunge? No. Member Eastford? 
No. Mr. Chair. Yes. So the motion fails three to two. Is there another motion that someone would wish to make? Is there another motion that someone would wish to make? Maybe for clarity, um, I'm actually fine with the current state of the guidance. So what I'm going to move, I will move that. Um, let me actually pull up the guidance. Could you repeat that, uh, Robin? You cut out on me for a second. Hold on. Sorry, I have a little heater on. It might be uh, making too much noise. So I just wanted to get, just give me one second to pull the guidance up. Uh, so I move that uh, the guidance indicate that the board will review and may adjust requested changes uh, to hospital charges. I'll second that. And I just want to make sure that I have the motion correct, Robin. Um, you have moved that for the fiscal year 2022 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board may review and make changes to charge request growth uh, request from hospitals. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I basically just read what's currently in the draft guidance, which says the board will also review and may adjust requested changes to hospital charges. OK, and it was seconded by member Holmes. Am I correct? Yes. Board discussion. So I'll just for myself, um, I, I just want to basically be on record that I do think that including a number in future years hospital guidance is an important improvement. Uh, particularly given the feedback that we had received from hospitals last year. I'm willing to forego that this particular year, given the circumstances and the uncertainties. Um, but I just want to be on record that in the future, I do think it's important to include a guidepost. Yeah, and I'll, I'll support what Robin just said. I, I agree with that as well. And I think to even add to that, um, the part that we're, is, has been missing as well is what's the relative price, commercial price, net pay that hospitals pay, you know, across each hospital. We've kind of talked a little bit before, um, you know, wherever a hospital starts. So if they're at $100 for something and somebody else is $70 for the same, same service and an increase comes in at, you know, 3%, that generates that's a three percent increase, which which follows you know maybe a low amount, but um, the outcome is very different. And so I, I think you know along with this, you know where price transparency is becoming a bigger topic and becoming more available, that you know relativeness should play a factor, you know across similar type hospitals. And you know, in some cases, we may find maybe we're really good, and we and we are underpricing. Where other places, it may be different. But because we start everybody on wherever they live in, you know, wherever they exist right now, like that's fine. And then we grow from there. You know, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on on pricing. Um, and now in the pandemic and with everything else going on, I think what the motion that Robin set forward. I can also support um, because it is also signaling more clearly maybe that we are looking at this and may adjust it because in the past it may have not been as explicitly stated and then there was pushback of of the ability to to make adjustments there um, so thanks I'll echo um, what Robin and Maureen have just said, I support a future guidepost um, to be sure. I think it's the pandemic that's making me hesitant. 
this year. Uh, but I would also say I agree with Maureen 100%. We need to understand the base. I think some of the work that we're doing to understand, uh, to support some of the sustainability work will help give clarity to starting points of different hospitals, what their prices, some better understanding about price variation and price to cost ratios. Uh, I also think our, if we're gonna look in the future, I think, and this is sort of just to remind our hospital budget team and our the, for conversations moving forward, I think we need to differentiate between change in charge and commercial rate um, and have a better understanding of that and perhaps think about guideposts around commercial rate. Um, and I also think we need to understand better and come to an agreement, maybe some consensus around what is medical inflation, what is the component that's uh, of commercial rate that's attributed to cost shift, and what is an appropriate uh, contribution to margin from that rate. So I think there's a lot of work to be done if we're going to put a guidepost out in the future. And I, But I, I welcome it, and I think it would be really helpful. Other board members? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the motion. So, Mark, I see your hand is up, but I'm not sure if that's just because of your previous uh, hand raising. I don't have the ability to lower them afterwards, so I'm not sure if you're trying to uh, offer additional public comment. I will lower it. Thank you, Kevin. I apologize for that. No problem. I do not see anyone else's hand raised. Is there any other public comment? Okay, um, General Counsel Barber, if you could call the roll. Uh, Member Pelham. Yes. Member Yusufer. Yes. Member Holmes. Yes. Member Lunge. Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. At this point, Patrick, could you tell me if I have left anything on the table or are we ready for a discussion on the acceptance of the total package? You are ready. Would a board member wish to make that motion? Happy to. Um, uh, so for hospital for fiscal year 2022 hospital budget review process, the Green Mountain Care Board approves the hospital budget guidance effective March 31st, 2020. Uh, and I'm just going to add as uh, discussed today. So just a couple of uh, changes. It should be 2021. Sorry. And um, subject to the um, amendments made by um, uh, majority motions uh, today. Thank you. I'm clearly I need some lunch. <laughs> I think point. we might all need it, but I did uh, sneak in a yogurt, so I'm pretty good shape. Um, is there a second? No, isn't it 2022? <laughs> We're, no, when it, the guidance becomes effective. I think I said March 31st, 2022, and I meant... Oh, got it. Okay. I was like, wait, have we just been doing 2021 hospitals? I'm kidding. No, no, no. It's just clear <laughs> that it's effective as of the end of this month. Okay. All right. I missed the 2022 on that. Well, she said 2020, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. You're behind. I don't think any of us want to do 2020 ever again. Can we just say that? <laughs> Exactly. I'll second that motion. Okay. Um, is there any discussion from the board members? Hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment. Mike Del Treco. So, um, Chair Mullen and board, I just want to thank you for all the time that you've uh, provided me and Patrick and his team. Um, clearly, we've gone through a lot of work and there's a lot of work to do going forward, but but thank, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mike, and we look forward to that continued work. And um, please know that I, I feel like um, we want to have the hospitals backs and we want to make sure we have a sustainable health care system moving forward. And we also want to make sure that that health care system is affordable to Vermonters, as I'm sure you do as well. So, you know, you have always been willing to come to the table. And while we may not always agree, um, I respect greatly uh, the hard work that you put in. Thank you. Mark, is your hand back up? Yes. And I would just like to call out the staff and all of this um, because, you know, they've been the ones and caught in the middle a little bit of, you know, maneuvering all of this. And, you know, I, for one, thought, you know, going into this, I didn't know how this conversation was going to go. But the manner in which it was laid out and spoken to by Patrick and his team, I think it really helped us efficiently walk through this. So I just wanted to call out the role that the staff played and, you know, thank them. And, you know, um, I'm glad we were able to give Maureen back a few hours for her birthday. So happy birthday. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. And thank you, Patrick, Kate and Lori and Russ for all the hard work that you've done on this. Um, other members of the public? Yeah, Kevin, what? Go ahead. Oh, this is Patrick. Sorry, I would. I was going to reiterate that, but I wanted other members of the public to um, have their opportunity to speak first. But I've asked a lot of Lori and Kate over the last couple of months uh, around this um, discussion point that we've reached today. So I want to extend my thanks to them for everything they've done, and I want to thank Mike and Russ from the legal team. Russ came on board and was immediately thrown into this process of ours so he has stood that up in a phenomenal fashion and we look forward to working with him in the future but i really wanted to thank the team for everything they've done to get us to this point thank you patrick um so with that i'm going to call the question and i'm going to ask mike barber to call the roll and the question before us is for the 2022 hospital budget review process the Green Mountain Care Board approves the hospital budget guidance effective March 31st, 2021, subject to the amendments approved by majority vote at the meeting today. Mike. Member Holmes. Yes. Member Yusufer. Yes. Member Pelham. Yes. Member Lunge. Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. And again, thank you, Patrick and team. And if you could uh, take down that slide. Um, I just want to, uh, again, publicly say to uh, all the hospitals that um, we understand the, the real calamity that you have been through that really started uh, a little more than a year ago today, but will continue for the next uh, several months and hopefully not beyond that. But we have to be cautious. We don't know what could happen with variants. And um, as was suggested earlier, um, our greatest hope is that we can return to um, a normal life where people don't live in fear of catching something that uh, can kill them. And with that, um, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? If not, a motion to adjourn is in order. If somebody um, has some musical talent and wishes to sing happy birthday to Maureen, please feel free. I know that I lack in that area, so I will not subject uh, everyone to that abuse. <laughs> That's okay. I'll just assume you guys all sang it to me. <laughs> adjourn before Maureen has to listen to us sing. Yeah, exactly. Second. So... There's a motion before us to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.